50 kilometers remaining in today's stage 13. Most of the work this today has been done by Francaise de Jeu and the couple of sky riders. Now we have more sky riders placing themselves within the front line here on the peloton. And one rider from Orica Green Edge as well. So there we are. So clearly we've got a situation where the sprinters teams are sort of beginning to line up here, Sean. Liquid gas don't have to do anything today. Katusha don't have to do anything today. It's all about the sprinters teams taking the last few opportunities they can. Well, they're certainly uh, lining it up and uh, lining it up from a long, long way out because uh, we have uh, Francaise de Joux on the front with Sky. Uh, other teams appear. We've seen Garmin coming up there. Ulrika Green out just starting to appear. Still with 50 kilometres to go, as it has been for a long time, the sprinters teams who are controlling it and 247 like they're not allowing any chance to the two no. men out in front at all and i'm surprised they did not leave and take a bit more and leave them hang there at four or five minutes at least and that way in the final they will stay out for quite a long time but now you're into a situation if it starts to get nervous at all and seems start pushing out in front to keep their leaders on the front well then this gap will you know just drop drastically quickly and uh, it could be a difficult final we could see a lot more attacks and as we've talked about you know they try and leave the breakaway hang out as long as possible it's not going to be easy with disadvantage with only two men out in front and they are going to get you know tired very quickly because with two men it's so more difficult than if you have able tend to share the pace setting out in the breakaway yeah I think it is getting a bit nervous to be honest as you said it's a long way out 50 kilometres to start the sprinters team's pushing on a little bit and bringing this gap down and start working together. Maybe they'll just hold it station here. But even so, just put the uh, thought in the mind of the other teams to try and get things together. Rabobank, there's a team who haven't offered anything yet to the, the front to work together. I'm not sure that they feel that they've got the legs. Teo Boss is still here. Will Teo Boss be available to do something today? One wonders. Uh, actually, he might fare a little bit better. It's a straight line. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Are I you mean... saying his bike handle is not good? I didn't say that. Uh, oh, yes, all right then. Well, I think, uh, first of all, uh, looking at the way Teo Boss is finishing, um, you know, he's struggling in the last group on the road every day. But again, he might be making the calculation. Uh, his team director might be saying, look, you can stay in that group. For the time limit, there's not a problem. Just conserve energy every day, conserve a little bit. And the stage 13 looks a good stage. Maybe we could do something there. And if he gets, if he gets, you know, a good run at the finish, and we know that if he can be taken to the last 200 meters and he can make his sprint straight out, he is very fast. That's what I was but he meaning, needs, really. He needs a perfect yeah, lead yeah. out. Uh, he needs a very good train. And within the Rabobank team, we haven't seen them being able to do that. But again. The sprinters, they're always hoping that they can hang around there in the top 15 riders, 20 riders in the final kilometres. And with a bit of luck, you get the right run at it in the final 150, 200 metres from the line. And if he gets that, he's always one capable of taking a stage victory. Yeah, that was the sensible point I was making. <laughs> uh, that if, I mean, he's got... Uh, Renshaw and he have been sharing duties, basically. Uh, to see it, uh, they turn turn about as to who the person is who's going to go for the sprint. They really should revert to type at this particular point, Sean, because we know Mark Renshaw is fantastically good at bringing a sprinter to the right place at the right time. And if, as you say, if Boss gets into the right place at the right time, he does have a hell of a turn of speed on him, and he might well be able to do something. And there aren't the intricacies of the running that we had earlier but they will have to be there in the last four or five kilometers up jostling with the with the guys at the front and that may cause him a problem yes and uh, boss he, if, he, if he's a good lead out as you said with Renshaw if they can get it right and Renshaw gets into the position with 350 meters out 400 meters where Renshaw can take it up and really you know start the sprint for boss and take him to that 200 meter mark and then just leave him Ha leave him have a run at it 
he could do something real well in that situation but it's difficult for Renshaw as well if he hasn't got another number of riders to take him to that position mm. then it's so difficult for Mark Renshaw to get to that 400 metre mark and really you know, take Buss to the point where he can go full out, full out for his sprint so you need a big train and that's where the train is so important we talk about it so many times if you have a team who can make a train with 7 or 8 riders real fast it's all calculated who is going to be the third last man off the second last man off and it just look, works like clockwork sometimes and we have seen that with teams you know in the past this year in the Giro we certainly haven't seen that with any team no, uh, they've got close to it, haven't they, uh, Sky? Once they've done it uh, quite well, uh, but not time and time and time and time again, as we used to see with HTC. They were they were brilliant in any situation, regardless of how difficult the finish was. They were fantastic at getting through the last two, two, three corners and delivering Mark Cavendish to the line at the right time. And Renshaw was invariably the last man off, Eitzel just before him. So they, they knew exactly what they had to do. Um, the other guy today, uh, worth just mentioning, Sean, and I don't think I'm not sure he's got the legs to be honest, because I think he's had a very tough Giro d'Italia so far. Andrea Guardini of Farnese Vini. We've got a man in the break, which means, of course, they don't have to do any riding. They could just sit there, wait, 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 and, uh, and then see if they can make something, some capital, out of the trains that are going to be delivering other riders to the line. Yes, uh, I think Guardini as well. He's a rider, you know, uh, capable of uh, winning a big bunch sprint. On a real good day, everything going right for him. He certainly has got uh, the turn of speed to be able to do that. And uh, it's all about just everything working out right in the final kilometres. And, you know, when you get into that final three kilometres, four kilometres, if you don't have to make any effort at all, you can stay in the top 15. You have maybe a number of teammates with you. Uh, and if you need to move up a bit, they do that for you. That is so important. And then in the final sprint itself that you're in the right position, the gap opens for you in that final 200 metres, 250 metres, and you can come through. Then he is, Guardini is capable of winning also. And that's what they're all hoping, that they will just get a lucky day. They're on a real good day as well. They feel good. And in that situation... Um, Guardini is the one you know who could win in a big in a big bunch sprint against uh, the better sprinters of the world. Yes, he could. Here's what they're up against. Look, we've been over the Monte Zermolo, and we're now running down towards the finish at Civeri. The first time the Giro d'Italia has been there. Uh, only a very short stage there, 121 kilometres in length. Another team will try and get their riders to the front. Colnago have uh, popped up in the last sort of five or six kilometres coming into sprints to try and deliver Sacha Modelo to the front. Uh, and maybe they will see them again in the pale blue of their, or sky blue of their kit. Other riders who will try and make something out of it, although they won't necessarily be delivered to the line by a team, particularly that one or two riders get them up there somewhere. Manuel Belletti of AG Tour Le Mondial. We saw him. Um, arrived behind Roberto Ferrari but he was a long way back but at least he got some sort of placing it was a terrifically long way back and of course Orica Greenwich we've not mentioned at all yet they will try and deliver Matt Goss if he's feeling up to it Ventoso has won a stage in the Giro d'Italia and We've just we talked about Visconti. Visconti's in very good shape, and he seems to be the man who's doing the, the delivering of Ventosa to the right place, Sean. Uh, um, uh, not normally a rider you'd associate with that because he's so quick. He's capable of doing that. Well, he is. Uh, he's very quick in his own right, um, but against the big sprinters, he's just mm. he's just a little bit uh, off that pace and. Not surprising that he is, you know, doing the work for Ventoso because he is capable of winning a sprint if he gets, again, if he gets in the right position, uh, he is capable of, you know, winning a big one sprint. And I think the one he's won already, um, the crash, it certainly served a little bit in his favour there. But again, you have to be in the right position at the right time. And they will be thinking in that way again. Uh, they're not hoping there will be a crash, of course, but... You know, the sprinters, that's, there's a little bit of a boxing uh, in of some of the big sprinters in that final couple of hundred metres, and you're at the right side. For example, if it's left and you're at the right-hand side, you get a good run at it. And uh, they're all thinking of that, and they're all going to try 
and you know have a goal for the sprint and Ventoso you know he is uh, certainly a one also that you cannot count out of a big bunch sprint it's like Mark has had to <laughs> remove undo his helmet for a bit of there of a scratch of a head or putting a new helmet on or something somebody asked earlier a question on at spokesman on Twitter uh, that Bernie Eisel had his head his uh, helmet off why is that allowed well he was changing a vest difficult to get your vest off over the helmet it would have been more dangerous to try and get the vest off over the helmet than it would to take the helmet off pass it to the car take the vest off put another one back on and put the helmet back on again from the risk of catching your vest on the helmet and then spearing off to the side of the road Coming down quite quickly this gap now, Sean. 140. Another, uh, what, 25 seconds off the gap. And uh, the other question is why were Garmin riding at the front? Garmin Barracuda. Do they think Robert Hunter has a chance today? I think he's been riding well, but I'm not sure he's got the outright speed. Again, against uh, Mark Cavendish. Um, Goss, for example, I don't think he's at that level. He hasn't that got, got that outright speed, but they seem to think that, uh, you know, they need to ride here today and they're uh, putting uh, some men up front. Um, so maybe he feels good. And maybe he said this morning in the briefing in the bus, I feel so good today. I can take it. I can take on, and I can take on any of those sprinters. Absolutely. Give me a crack. I want to go. If you want to stay in the Tour de France, Robert Hunter. Riding uh, for Barlow World. Years ago now. It might have been 2007, actually. It might have been the, the year when the tour came to uh, Great Britain. He has a particular sprinting style. He does start throw the bike, or he used to, certainly, throw the bike around underneath him. He was just lay the bike on the side, from one side to the other. Shows how good the tyres are for gripping. And the stage he won the Tour of France, it was also, uh, there was a crash in the final roundabout, very yes. close to the finish. Uh, but I'm you know, not suggesting that's why he won, uh, but I think some of the sprinters got into difficulty. But again, you I know, think he was ahead of the, the yes, crash. Yes, he was just there, yeah. ahead. And, and um, But, you know, that's something that uh, you have to have the look that uh, if there is a crash, that you're just in the right place, that you're not uh, involved in it, and you get through. And uh, then a sprinter who is maybe not the fastest one in the uh, race at that moment, uh, you get the opportunity in that way. Is your money on another Cav win today, Sean? Yes, I think uh, Cav is going to be difficult to beat when he gets to that point uh, where he can just uh, go... 200 meter mark uh, he is so ex explosive but again you know how uh, fresh is he how much has he you know been into the reserves uh, that is the other question and also the lead out is so important here uh, all of that you have to make you know the, you have to get everything right first of all the run in that he gets a good lead out and uh, in this race uh, you know he's had a few uh, little problems where with crashes and the lead out hasn't been maybe as as good he was he would expect it to be or he would like it to be uh, but uh, still I think you know he's the man if you're if you're going to the bookies uh, it would be hard to be you know going past Cavendish yeah, it would be it would be very difficult to see past uh, that Christian Meyer Canadian rider has uh, spent a long time on the front here Working for Orica Green Edge. And with good reason. Because their man Matthew Goss is now lying second in the points competition. 65 points, plays 77. Cavendish has 77. Joaquim Rodriguez has 55. But Goss uh, will uh, continue to try and take the battle to Mark Cavendish. Joaquim Rodriguez holds the pink jersey again uh, today. Mikhail uh, Golash, the mountains classification jersey. A healthy gap now over Rubiano. He has 33 points. Rubiano has 24. And uh, Caruso still holds the best young riders jersey. Rubiano Caruso of Liquid Gas. That's the white jersey with little pink sleeve ends on it. Uh, ahead of Rigoberto Uran of Sky at 8 seconds and Sergio Heno at also Sky 
at 25 seconds. There's Brian Bulgak, the next two athlete, just going through the shot. He's been in a few breaks. And his teammate, Olivia Kaysen, was the man who was um, in the lead of the breakaway competition, the Fuga Pinarello, for a while. And it looks to me as if Martin Kaitzer is going to take that over today, having been out in the break once more. 40 kilometres to go. And nobody's really yet uh, panicking, Sean. There's still a lot of chat in the, the peloton. Lars back yesterday's winner having a laugh with teammate uh, Brian Bulgak. There is Scarponi, number one in the pink and blue of Lamprey, just behind Damiano Cornigo. You can always tell his style, always has his knees very slightly out. Damiano Cornigo, much shorter than a lot of riders. Number two on his back. The run in today, not at all tricky, Sean. Uh, well, there's a couple of bends at about, you know, five, six kilometres out, but it's not... It's not as if it's going to be anything like we've seen. If you're used uh, to watching the Giro d'Italia this year and you think that they throw in a, uh, a hairpin bend at 350 metres at every sprint, then you'd be wrong. Because today isn't like that at all. One minute, just about. Now it's going to start speeding up. I think they might just leave them dangle out there 30, 40 seconds ahead. Well, I was expecting to leave them dangle at 1.45, uh, 1.50, and um, they haven't done that, and uh, they seem to be closing it down. Will they just knock it off a bit and allow them to stay out there? But our two uh, leaders are doing a really strong ride here because with two out front, uh, it's, it's a difficult task. Uh, you know, you're torn at the front to do your pull, as we can see the, uh, uh, the rider from Farnese, uh, staying on the front and um, doing his turn and then he just peels off and the rider from Vaconsole takes over so you share that 150 200 metres on the front and with two it comes around very quickly where if you have 8 or 10 riders well then in the slipstream you get much longer time so you recover that bit better but they're still pushing on real well here and our two leaders are putting up a big fight uh, but again it's all down to the peloton now to stay decide when they want to pull them in because they have you know so many teams here just waiting and if they decide really to push it on well then this minute and four advantage will just in a number of kilometers they could close them down if they wish to do so okay so who are we going to try and see getting up for the sprint other than the obvious contenders matthew goss uh, mark cavendish and so on uh, who will try and gain something out of the sprint today. We've mentioned Manuel Belletti for AG to our Le Mondial and the uh, stage winner previous to that, Roberto Ferrari of the Androni squad, will certainly try and have a go to get up towards the front. Uh, for Colmago, Sasha Mordolo has a good turn of speed. He'll be de delivered by Marco Colladan. And Sasha Mordolo, who's placed very high in Milan San Remo in the past and has uh, a, a very good sprint. And again, this might well suit him because it's very straight. We might see a lot more riders who we haven't seen an awful lot of. Guardini, we've already mentioned from Farnese Vini, as we have done with uh, uh, Francis de Jure's Arnold Desmarais. Robert Hunter the South African national champion. He'll be easy to spot in the sprint because his jersey is essentially a South African flag. Orica Greenwich of Matthew Goss back in the green and white and black of the team strip rather than that red jersey of the points. Uh, the Katusha team and Liquid Gas team will just keep it under control because uh, although Caruso will be mixing it up in the sprint, the best young rider, they are looking to the overall classification. And maybe Adam Hansen from Lotto Bellasol, although we're not really sure how he's featuring. Hansen, who's not been uh, in fantastically great shape, and I think he's tried to get out a little bit uh, on the run-ins to sprints, has attacked, and yesterday was involved in a fall, so we never know. The big unknown, of course, is will Renshaw sprint, or will Teo Boss sprint? I have a feeling that Renshaw will lead out Teo Boss in this one because it's the most likely combination 
to do something. Giacomo Nizzolo for Radio Shack has been getting faster, but he's still not fast enough, Giacomo Nizzolo. Netta have young Daniel Sean, the Austrian, wearing 199 on his back. So if you see a Netta rider up there, 199, it'll be him, I would guess. And uh, Team Saxo Bank, well, JJ Hado has been close, but no cigar, as they used to say at American Fairgrounds when you didn't win things. Uh, close, but no cigar for JJ Hado, and he's a man who can hold his own in a bit of rough and tumble, so he may well be up there as well, and he's got some good lead-out men, especially Matteo Tozzato, who can deliver him quite happily up to the front and keep him there at the moment. Uh, your pick for today is Mark Cavendish, Sean. I'm going to stick my neck out and, and go for Tail Boss again, but we'll have to see how it how it's, uh, works out. We don't know, actually, whether it'll be Renshaw or Boss, but uh, if that was the way around it was going to be, Renshaw leading out and Boss following, then I'll give him a chance. We shall see. Greg Henderson writing in to me on uh, Twitter. Always, here to, always great to hear from you, Greg. A man who knows a thing or two about uh, sprinting himself. He says JJ Hado today. What do you think? I was just going to say JJ Hado. Um, I think, uh, you know, he's he's good at positioning himself and um, he has a team which can, you know, do a, a nice bit for him. Um, I would say that uh, if there's anybody going to, you know, challenge Mark Cavendish, I think Hado could be the one who um, would be capable of doing it and he is good at keeping position. Uh, the other one is Chichi, for example. If he gets uh, a Kiki, real, yeah, yeah, yeah. if he gets a real good run as well, he is very fast. But he has to, everything has to go perfect for him because he's a rider who suffers a bit. I think if the speed is real high and he has to make any effort at all to move up, then he's fine. The sprint, uh, uh, he pays, he pays with that. And uh, but if he gets you know a real good run in and no problems at all, then he. Um, he has got that turn of speed. Mark uh, wanting to get back to the car and saying to the motorcycle, for goodness sake, they see if they've got a problem with the helmet. Yeah, that's a bit annoying, isn't it? When a motorcycle just sits there to film you and it's clear that you want to get back to the cars. New helmet for Mark, seems to be. And then it'll be uh, new glasses, I imagine. Everything all good, though, for Mark uh, Cavendish. Just needed a helmet change. But uh, getting back to the car is important. Get back there, do what you have to do, and get back up to the peloton again, especially with the 35 kilometres to go. But quite a, uh, quite a cool cookie, Sean, getting them back there at this time. Get it done now while you have to. Well, I think uh, for a sprinter, you can be cool at this time, 35 kilometres, and... Uh, with the situation, you know, two riders out in front and uh, just a fraction over a minute of an advantage and a number of teams riding on the front, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not a problem and uh, to move up in the peloton, that is the, probably the most difficult thing but I'm sure there will be riders, uh, you know, pretty much to the tail end of the bunch here and we will see them picking up Mark Cavendish and taking him through to the very front of the peloton. Doctor's Cup attending uh, to the needs of uh, Gabriel Rach. Norwegian rider used to ride for the Cervelo Test Team. And there's Mark just working his way up on the right hand side of your shot. Black shorts, red jersey. Working his way back up at the outside to his uh, Sky Men. No uh, problem at all, no hassle. So we think the men who may well uh, really be dicing it out today, Sean, are Mark Cavendish uh, and JJ Hado. Uh, do you think Matt Goss will be up there? I oh, think yes. Yep, Goss as well. He, he's got the team, and uh, unless he's carrying you know, uh, quite a big injury uh, from the fall a number of days ago, uh, he certainly should be up there. He's got the team also to do quite a lot of work there. Uh, experienced in that they have some very good riders capable of getting them into a good position but again it's you know Cavendish Goss those are the big ones JJ Hado if I get big odds yes I put a bit of money on him otherwise 
uh, I'd have to go for the big sprinters like Cavendish or Goss. Interesting to know what the odds were on uh, JJ Hayder this morning. If anybody's been uh, uh, looking at the odds, let us know. Well, if you look down at the riders who've pulled out of this year's Giro d'Italia, and there aren't that many, to be honest, so far. Um, about a half of them are sprinters or semi-sprinters. Tor Hushoff, who just wasn't on form at all and just after a few days said, you know what, I'm absolutely knackered. Filippo Pozzato, well, he's not a, a pure sprinter, but he's got a fair old whack of speed in the right circumstances. He's got a fair old whack of handlebars up the backside of Matt Goss as well. And that's what uh, put him out. He had uh, a scaphoid uh, broken in that crash with Gossi. Tyler Farrett suffering again from a crash and uh, having problems for Garmin Barracuda so their lead sprinter out Daniele Bernati not well and uh, Roman Felu also just not being in, in super form and had uh, a crash in Denmark as well which uh, didn't help either so a lot of sprinters already out yeah they're just leaving them there for the moment now Sean just to add about a minute it shows how much they want to be attentive, though, in this year's Giro. It's uh, certainly, I think, over the last maybe two, three, four years, possibly a bit more, maybe less, but maybe four or five years, uh, the peloton has not wanted breakaways to get massive distances away. There have been notable exceptions, and often it's been uh, the weather that's played a part in that. We can think of uh, back... In the Tour de France, 2006 was like that, and that really turned the race upside down. 2010's Giro was a little bit like that. Very weather-enhanced, though. Uh, 12 minutes of a gap, that big group of 36, I think it was, 34 or 36 who got. Uh, but um, in general, Sean, I think the peloton keeps things much more under control than they used to. Certainly, I think the breakaways are uh, you know, allowed to... Uh very little advantage compared to you know, in the past they would be allowed many more minutes and in this Giro we have seen the first uh, 10 days of race and they haven't been allowed any advantage at all um, with any opportunity or any possibility of going to the finish and they just really keep the time limit down and in the final 50 60 kilometers plus they just leave them hang out there and just waiting to the moment until they want to close them down where you know you go back a number of years ago the break would get six eight minutes of an advantage then the peloton will really push on the final and it would be you know difficult at 20 kilometers to go 30 kilometers to go to, uh, to make a calculation are they going to get caught or are the break going to stay away where there was uh, very little occasions in this race where you could say the break had any chance of holding on. So what do you do about that when you're planning your race, Sean? I mean, the, the breakaways follow the traditional pattern of trying to get away and see how far they can go and get back. I mean, obviously there's various reasons for getting in a breakaway, but it, it doesn't seem to be as much of a chance that you used to have. Is there some way that we should be thinking of new tactics for, for breakaways? Well, it's uh, it's a difficult one because, first of all, you get into the breakaway and you're a team who want to get into breakaways because you know in a big sprint like today you haven't got any chance of winning a stage or getting any uh, glory from the stage. So you try and get into the breakaway. Uh, you get out there with two or six riders, whatever the case may be. But if the bunch and the teams of sprinters, they... Uh, they want to control things and play it safe, which they have been doing. And that is the cold, the tactic at the moment, it seems to be in this Giro. And also in other races uh, during the season, I think more so maybe this year, from the beginning of this year, that has been the case where they do not allow the breakaway to get away at all. In the Belgium races, in the semi-classics, you know, so difficult to get into the breakaway, first of all, because very very aggressive race in the first 50 or 60 kilometers and then when the break gets away they only allow them three minutes two and a half minutes and they never just give them any mm. big advantage compared to maybe four or five years ago or less they you know the break would get seven and eight minutes or more or sometimes. ten minutes yeah. and they still would catch them yep. in the final without any major difficulty and i know from our team racing in belgium in the semi-classics talking to the director of sportive he said it's amazing now that they just do not allow the breakaway to get any advantage at all to have a chance to get into the final 
50 kilometres of the event. Uh, they just keep tabs on it and they just close them down 50, 60 kilometres from the finish. It does seem to be uh, less and less point to get in the breakaway, to be honest, uh, than you used to be. Absolutely. But um, that's something that we're, I'm sure we'll return to discuss. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, to get a big... Um, big classic like the Tour of Flanders. I mean, it wasn't that long ago we were sitting and saying who's in the breakaway, and it would be riders from you know Topsworld Flandern and Landbau Credit and and whoever else were the smaller teams there, and they'd have 10, 12, 15 minutes, 16 minutes advantage, and let them go and go and go and go, and eventually they'd be brought back. But for them that was a massive thing. But now two, three minutes, that's about it. And then there's you could always see that little spark of hope in the eyes of some poor first year Landbau credit rider who got into it and just piling the pressure on himself and the, when the peloton started to cut down the gap because he thought well I've got a chance here I've got to have a go for this and he did thank you to Greg Henderson once again brilliant piece of information why is Mark Cavendish changing his helmet the one he's put on now has no vents 20 watts at 70 kilometers an hour that's what it saves you apparently so that's the advantage Closed vent helmet, 20 watts at 70 kilometres, and that's why he went back to change the helmet, so there's no vents in it. We're running into... Uh Chevrolet today, the first time that the Giro d'Italia has ever finished uh, in this uh, town. We've still got the town of uh, Doniani to go through. And uh, Cerasco. With 30k to go. Still just about a minute separating Martin Keitze here from Vaconsole along with uh, Francesco Faili from the peloton and uh, we've been discussing with Sean just why just how things have changed in the last 10 years let's say but even less to the breakaway in your day Sean if a breakaway went and you got into a breakaway I mean in a, in a day like today in a stage like today would you how much would you think about gaining what would be normal 15 minutes I think uh, when you consider two riders out in front, um, you need to get 15 minutes at least to have any chance of holding on in the end. Mm. Although the riders have changed as well, I think. Yeah, this level of uh, the, le the standard of riders has got much better. And you know, you take riders uh, in a team, in the smaller teams, uh, I think uh, they've got they've got closer to the bigger teams as well. The difference is not so great. If you go back 15 years ago, a smaller team, they wouldn't have a rider as strong as the smaller teams, let's call them here. If you look at Team NetApp, for example, like they have some very good riders. And even if you get a, a group of five or six riders from uh, smaller teams or the weaker riders, let's call them, in the team, they can go unbelievably fast and they can ride for so long out in front and that's changed i suppose the tactic of the teams of the sprinters they cannot allow the brakes to have that bigger advantage which we had 15 years ago because it's going to be more difficult to close them down in the end and it's going to take more energy as well because you have to ride so fast in the end where if you just allow them three four minutes then you can up your pace gradually as you get closer to the finish and take them back with a lot less effort mm -hmm. and then you have got riders also capable of preparing the sprints for the sprinters teams who have been doing the work in the earlier part of the race keeping control of the breakaway but they can still go into the final right quite strong so you know that calculation is there but i think yes everybody in the bunch here they've certainly got more equal in level of fitness level of strength than 15 years ago now john mcmillan writing in uh, on uh, Twitter at spokesman S P O K E S M E N brings up the old proverbial nugget here. Uh, we've discussed it many, many, many times. Surely radios have a part to, part to play in this because everybody knows what's going on. We, we've mentioned it maybe half a dozen times in the Giro already. Radios and television, everybody knows what's going on. There's no real reason for breaks to be able to get away 15 minutes anymore. Well, if uh, if you take the radios away, 
then the director of sport teams are not uh, as free to get information mm. as much to the riders. Uh, so I think it would be a, a different situation. They'd probably not allow the breakaway to take uh, the same advantage, although it's difficult to uh, uh, to see them not allowing what the two breakaway riders, uh, the maximum advantage they were given today. But uh, with the radius, they should be able to calculate better because they know exactly how much the riders are ahead and they can relay that to the riders. So uh, by taking away the radios, I don't think that's going to change anything at all. Interesting. It's the other argument, isn't it? it Wouldn't change anything at all. The other thing is, I didn't notice. I mean, you go back 25 years, young, to 20, 25 years, Sean. A lot of big name riders could get in breaks. A lot of stars could get in breaks. You get two or three guys, and it just doesn't seem to happen anymore. 56 seconds is our gap. Jeremy Hunt on the front there, just using this slipstreaming out of the back of that uh, motorcycle. And that pulls away again. We're inside the last 30 kilometres. And we're in the uh, town of uh, Torliani. We're over the river and uh, fantastically huge, massive church. 52 seconds, uh, so they brought it down rather than a minute, they're just going to keep it there. And the big question is, has Matt Goss recovered enough from tumbling a couple of times to be able to contest the sprint today? My feelings are yes, because we have had Christian Meyer on the front all the way for the last uh, 20 kilometres or so, 20, 25 kilometres. And now Rabobank have a man up the front as well. There's Mark Cavendish in the red jersey. And a number of teams now just sharing the work to keep the things rolling on. Well, what does Matt Goss think his own chances up? So far we had so difficult sprint, I guess, uh, for you and for the other sprinters. Do you think that today it could change? Uh, I hope so. It's uh, not a very long stage today, but it's quite difficult. It's going to be really fast start, up, uphill most of the way, and um, you know, then I think we're going to have a big chase to the finish because it's definitely going to be a group go away and it's going to be a group of strong riders. So um, you know, hopefully we can get it back for a sprint. It'd definitely be nice to have uh, another crack at a, a stage win. How to beat uh, Cavendish and the Sky team? Because it's not easy for you. No, it's not easy for anyone. You already did it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, look, we've just got to, I've got to have confidence in the guys and I have 100% confidence in them. and. We've done done good lead outs in the first week here. Um, unfortunately, you know, the other stage where I was set up for another good result, I crashed and crashed again yesterday. So it depends how the body is today. But if everything's fine, then we, we just get the guys on the front and uh, we try and take the race from the front and try and try and get another win. No worries. Well, Matt Goss fairly upbeat, Sean, but uh, a little bit. He thought it was going to be a bit uh, faster racing than today. And he also thought there'd be a bigger group go away. Yes, and I think... Um, it's an easier day than you thought. Yes, I think it's been an easier day. And when you look at uh, yesterday, I suppose, the way uh, Katusha um, Rodriguez controlled the race, I thought they would be much more nervous in the start of the race because teams would be saying, well, if a group of six or eight riders get away and somebody's in the general classification seven or eight minutes and uh, they put a big advantage out, who's going to start chasing? And... I was expecting a lot of teams to be you know, really on the front and trying to get into the breaks, but it wasn't the case at all. The two riders here we have in the breakaway at the moment, they just attacked us less than a kilometre after mm. the start. They rode away and, and there was no, re no reaction. No. Thirty-six seconds. Only now is the gap, and all the cars will be coming past those two guys pretty soon. The peloton reaches 25 kilometres to go. With Matt Goss in the middle of your shot there, number 100 in the green and white and black of Orica Green Edge. And clearly feeling a little more upbeat about his chances today. It's been a very predictable day today, actually. 
because we had two guys go away very early at 1.5 kilometers Martin Keitzer and uh, Francesco uh, Faili and the peloton just let them right away nobody bothered chasing them and then when they got to about four minutes they just begin to shut them down a bit uh, well a little bit more than that for four and a half five minutes and then they began to shut it down gradually gently with Sky working on the front, Francis de Jure working on the front. Uh, now we've got uh, Rabobank there as well. Uh, Garmin Barracuda had some riders up there at one time, possibly for Robert Hunter. All the sprinters want a chance today, and that's because of the terrain, Sean, and the distance. It's a very, very short stage today compared to what we've had. Well, short stage in general for stage races, 121 kilometres, and only one categorised climb, and that one a fourth cat. Yes, and... Um for those guys, 121 kilometers is you know, a, an easy day, uh, and then the stage has been you know, pretty uh, relaxed as well. It has not been aggressive at all in the earlier part of the stage, and it could have went on for 50, 70 kilometers. Uh, a very aggressive race in which we had yesterday, and that would you know make people tired for the final. So there's a lot of riders here going to get to this finish with a little bit more energy than normal, and uh, that would be an interesting one as well. Maybe some of the sprinters that normally Probably not as good uh, in the uh, in the final here. Uh, better opportunities today, and I suppose Boss is a one. The big distance, he doesn't like that. The shorter stages, is, I think, if you look at his results, um, the shorter stages, he's certainly you know that bit better. But coming from the track, he doesn't have the background of doing the longer distance. So maybe uh, he could finish uh, much better today he might have much more energy and be that stronger in this final sprint yeah well he's my pick for today actually so boss that is if Renshaw is leading him out we don't know because they've been doing turn and turn about uh, boss helping Renshaw Renshaw helping boss if that's the that's the plan anyway that's what they agreed before uh, they came to the Giro d'Italia clearly when Mark Renshaw went to Rabobank he wanted to be able to sprinter in his own right but it's not really quite worked out for him yet to be a, a top class uh, contender against some of the others but you can't pick a rider if he gets a good lead out you have to pick a rider and you have to accept what happens oh yeah you, we cannot say oh yes boss would have won well, if he got a lead well it's no leave. good you coming along and saying well maybe boss can do well now changing your tune well, I'm and just Hader well, first we had Cavendish then Hader and now boss I'm, Thank going, you, I'm going for Cavendish and uh, that's it doesn't matter if the bleed out if he doesn't get a good lead out um it's not going to be my I'll excuse go for boston all right good and greg henderson will win having gone for jj hayden <laughs> there we go 22 seconds now somebody will clip off won't they in the last six six kilometers and, and win somebody highly unlikely time. yeah well they're going to be going so quickly it would, would never ever happen Lars back, he'll have another go. <laughs> 18 seconds, the catch is almost upon us with 22 kilometers to go here in this stage 13 of the Giro d'Italia. Who's it going to be lucky for? Who is it going to be unlucky? 13th stage on a Friday? Mm, you never know. Keep your fingers crossed, there's no more... Uh, big hectic ones today although actually Sean we've had hectic runs in with uh, difficult bends being put in but something like this as we're coming towards the end of the uh, sprinters uh, abilities to actually do something in this race could be just as hectic because they're all going to be piling on the pressure in the last 5k yes uh, one of the last opportunities uh, for some teams some riders uh, you know haven't got anything out of the race um, last opportunity for, you know with the big difficult stages to come uh, it could be very hectic and also a short stage, a relatively easy stage as well. So everybody is arriving that bit fresher. So uh, it could be a very hectic finish. And this long straight, it doesn't give a guarantee because it depends on what way the running is. If it's real fast and it's being pulled along by a team at 65 kilometers per hour in the final two, three kilometers, then it makes it a bit safer. But if there's a moment where it slows down and they all group together and they're doing still 55k an hour it can become very hectic there are our two riders just ahead of the peloton now and it's going to be grupo compacto as they say yep very shortly 
Well, not much in the uh, bag for Francesco Faeli, but let's get, let's get another 500 meters in the bag, if I can, says Martin Keitzer. I tell you what, I'll just keep going for a little bit longer, shall I, before you take me back, because uh, I am in the lead now of the Fuga Pinarello, the uh, breakaway prize. That's Steph Clement is the man on the front. Former Dutch uh, national time trial champion. Good for this sort of thing. Got sent out the uh, stage into Assisi. <laughs> it did the most extraordinary run. Clearly got the, uh, got a, um, how should we put it? Um, a severe shouting at, or the team had, from the team car. Had nobody in the break and off he went chasing down the breakaway. Picked up two guys from the breakaway who had been dropped off and paced them all the way back up to the others again. And then got on the front and went, uh, Great guns. There's Robert Hunter's jersey right in the middle. South African flag, you can see. There's another man we haven't mentioned, Alexander Kristoff in the Norwegian champion's jersey. Won, uh, won four with the Norwegian flag on the back. Another very good sprinter, and he's been there or thereabouts, but I'm not sure he'll be fast enough against Cavendish and Goss, but he's not too far off. The man full of bandages. There is uh, Velasco. Just looking at Katusha at the front, Sean. Makes they've got to do another job today. They've been looking after uh, the uh, interests of Joaquim Rodriguez. And they'll still have a couple of men with him or a man with him. But they've got to look after Alexander Kristoff today. Well, it will be interesting to see what they will do. Um, I doubt if they will really commit with too many men uh, for Christoph. Uh, also, the risk of you know being up there on the sprint, I think he will be uh, pretty much alone mm. and try and follow the other teams and the other sprinters. At the moment, though, they're here for uh, just pacing him along at the front and the pink jersey as well. You can see, in fact, the pink jersey of Joaquim Rodriguez is almost next to Alexander Kristoff, yes, who's just, just hidden behind Kaczynski. I think the interest is the pink jersey mm. and uh, in the final, the position they're in the moment with race leader, Joachim Rodriguez going so well. Uh, the authors would be the team rolled not to take too much risk in the end because, again, you know, if you get involved in these uh, big pile-ups, you could uh, get two or three men come out with, with a lot of injuries and carry that for the next number of days and that's not what they need within Katusha. They need to have, you know, all the men at their best or, or close to their best and I'd be surprised if they really get involved in the sprint. We're inside the last 20 kilometres here in stage 13 of the Giro d'Italia. It's going to be unlucky for somebody and very lucky for perhaps that man in the middle there in the red jersey. Points leader, Mark Cavendish. Sky have had a man at the front for most of the day, just helping to control the pace, along with his team in the middle and the white Francis du Jou. Uh, Arnold Desmarais, they want to set him up and give him some sort of chance. He's already said he thinks the sprints in the Giro d'Italia are absolutely crazy. I don't think he's going to dispel that at all today, frankly because today is the day that the sprinters will have to try and get something out of this if they haven't already. Roberto Ferrari's got a win, Goss has got a win, Cavendish has got wins. There's a whole raft of sprinters and second-tier sprinters here who haven't got anything out of this Giro d'Italia yet. Demare being one of the big ones, uh, the under-23 world champion and has uh, showed massive promise as a sprinter. Everybody's got to beat that man Cavendish there. Robert Hunter, he had to work early on for Tyler Farrer. Did a very good job for Tyler Farrer. Tyler Farrer wasn't up to the finish. That was the problem. Alexander Kristoff for the Norwegian champion for Katusha. He's been there or thereabouts. And a whole load of other riders moving up towards the front. It'll be interesting to see how Caruso goes, the best young rider for liquid gas. So green, lime green shorts, but it'll have that white jersey. And here comes into the front our Rabobank. Graham Brown comes up close to the front. And uh, what are they going to do today? Slip in behind uh, Steph Clement hip. They've got uh, a chance, but it's the last one they've got, Sean, really. Yes, it is. Uh 
one of the last opportunities I think uh, for their sprinters uh, Rabobank and uh, you know it's been a very poor event for them they haven't got into the breakaways with anybody mm. so you know the, the exposure they've got out of this uh, Giro d'Italia is you know the minimum and uh, if they could get a stage victory here well that would make everything good and it would just be turning it all around for them and there's many other teams as Rabobank uh, in that situation and you know, we're at the uh, start of the mountain stages and everybody is going to be real nervous and uh, there's going to be a big push on from the ones who really hasn't got the uh, the race they would like to, the, you know, the results they would like to have at this moment. They're going to push it that bit more. They are indeed. Rabobank is a prime example. Rabobank brought a team of essentially uh, sprinters and semi-sprinters, Renshaw, Boss, Lisa, who's gone home, unfortunately, now, but he can do a good lead at Graham Brown. Uh, and they've got uh, two guys who are climbing really well, uh, Tom Schlachter. And uh, we haven't seen much of him, but watch out for him. Juan Manuel Garate a little later. The big ruler here being Steph Clement. Uh, Dennis Van Vinden would have been helping out with these as well, but he's had a, he had a dreadful, dreadful Giro d'Italia on the deck a couple of times and uh, he's gone home so uh, they really haven't got much out of it so far the other one Farnese Vini Andrea Guardini could do well today or could do better today than he has done anything that's got a really difficult lumpy finish is going to be difficult for Guardini but the pace is steadily, steadily increasing here, Sean with Orica Green Edge on the uh, left-hand side of the peloton so the top-hand side of your screen uh, Team Sky nearest to us, uh, Katusha in the middle, uh, can't see who else is down there, but uh, our Francis Dujeu in the middle of the white. We've got essentially four four pace lines teeing themselves up here. Yes, and uh, as you say, this pace is just starting to go up and up, and uh, we can see they're going at a very fast rate at the moment. Still just outside the 15 kilometers to go, and it's uh, going to go faster and faster as we get to this uh, this finish. And we can see just teams, you know, uh, in line here. A number of jerseys from each team, one behind the other, and uh, keeping the pace really high. And it's just higher it's going to get. It's interesting to see the way that. Organic nature of the peloton, the way it moves, everybody reacts, pinches down into that little space because they were all strung out across the road. One, two, three, four lines of of teams looking after their riders, and then they came upon the camera bike, camera motorcycle, quicker than it was going. And they just pinched into that little space. 15 kilometers remaining here in stage 13. One, two, three, four, five, six. Orica Green Edge Riders, the last man in line being Matt Goss. Everything being teed up for him. Three riders from Rabobank in the middle. Boss, I think, being the last one in there. The Lamprey Riders are not there for the sprint. They're there to keep their men Scarponi and Kunigo out of trouble, as are the Astana men. One, two, three, four of them on the almost on the top edge of your screen in that turquoise colours with the yellow flashes on keeping Romain Kreisinger well out of difficulty by keeping him at the front there is Romain Kreisinger, you see him three back and Paolo Terralongo just behind him teams who've not made it to the front yet helping out their sprinters short or well, not many of the riders up towards the front uh, you can see Omega Farmer quick step but there's not a huge amount of them only a couple of riders from Movistar, and one of them is, uh, in fact, Ventoso, sitting on the coattails of, of other teams here. Yes, and um, depending on the strength and depth of a team, uh, if you haven't got a real strong team, you have to try and uh, wait back a bit, because still with uh, 13 kilometres uh, to go, uh, you have to play the waiting game. and. Uh, when you look at the uh, the Androni team, for example, of Ferrari, they haven't got uh, uh, the team to start riding on the front at this moment, so they, he has got to wait. And uh, the same situation for Colnago Modelo, for example, you know, he has to follow the other teams and play the waiting game. And hopefully, there will be one or two there in the end that can give him some little bit of a help, where you know you have the bigger teams who can ride 
Ulrika Green Edge, you know, they have this real specials and that the big power for riders. And we can see, you know, the six of them here in front of Matty Goss. And uh, if you've got that, well, then you can afford to do it. But again, uh, we can see now at the moment, Sky, they've backed off a bit. They're allowing the other teams to do it. And if you can keep your troops together, not too far off the front and just play the waiting game, that is the best way to do it then you conserve as many men as possible for the final three four kilometers and we can see there just in the middle at the moment uh, the sky riders are just staying behind the green edge and allowing the other teams to do the work for the moment still with you know over 12 kilometers to go it's generally winding up Fumiaki Beppu is the rider for Orica Green Edge on the front. You can see the uh, pace that the peloton is moving at now. A couple of riders at at the back, just uh, on a on a bad day, just hanging on at the back. And there's a few little gaps appearing here, Sean, as it speeds up at the front here. Yes, uh, gaps starting to appear a little bit, but I think. Uh we will see it all tightening up again and uh, Rabobank of the team who is uh, a different tactic I think, we haven't seen him like this very much of the four at this point still with 12 kilometres out uh, so it seems to be that uh, yeah, they have got a tactic in mind, uh, team director have said look guys you have to you know, just ride more to the front, try and stay together as much as possible, keep you know, four or five riders mm. minimum together in the final kilometres but uh, you know, is that a good thing? That's the question because if you do it too early well then you're guaranteed to pay the price in the end when you're going at this speed of you know, 50 plus kilometres per hour certainly at the moment It would appear that uh, it is boss leading or doing the work for Renshaw today because Renshaw is further back in the line here. Boss is second in line for, for Rabobank. But still Orica Greenedge to the uh, business on the front. Seems to have just, just throttles back a little as we go up this uh, tiny climb. Well, this it depends if they put the, the real hammer down here. This may cause some people problems, but I don't think so. I'm going to keep the pace under control here. Orica Green Edge because they don't want Matt Goss, who can climb these sort of things, to be in any sort of trouble. It's the bump. Wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. It's there. All under control. And Cavendish climbing quite happily here. Brett Lancaster waiting in line to do his turn. Robert Hunter in the uh, South African jersey just behind. Uh, Brett Lancaster actually was Ventoso in the Movistar, the dark blue, remember Movistar in dark blue with those green helmets. And then they're out on the top of this climb when they get uh, just around this last hairpin. And no problems for any of the sprinters on this one, Sean. No, I don't think there will be any problems because we can see uh, Ulrika Greenhead just uh, keeping the pace uh, at a good rate but certainly not uh, pushing it on big time and they don't need to do that uh, for Machi Gus uh, and uh, the other teams uh, other sprinters are pretty comfortable here at the moment if they did really attack it here and go up full out from the bottom uh, it would put them under difficulty but they're not doing that and uh, this is going to you know help the sprinters to stay in with ease and uh, if you have really you know to dig in deep on this one well then for the sprints uh, in the end you could you know suffer a little bit but it's not the case boss has moved to the back of the Rabobank line everybody's together as they uh, come over this final little lump through uh, Carrasco It has been Orica Greenedge who've led it on. Mark Cavendish about one, two, three, four, five, six back. Somebody writing in at uh, at spokesman saying we don't all like Cav, you know. Well, we talk about him because he's the best sprinter here. That's why we talk about him, and he's got the points jersey, so deserves the the, uh, the talk. Ten kilometres remaining here on stage 13. It's Orica Greenedge trying to lead out and control the pace for Matthew Goss. He's trying to pull back a win on uh, Cavendish and the battle is still fairly tight for the points jersey. 77 to Cavendish, 65 to Goss.
Well, Sean has gone for Mark Cavendish for the win today. And Greenidge would want to keep up control of this. Make sure it's safe coming in. That's the main thing. Now, I've gone for Boss today. The same person actually said, why have you been slagging off Boss for days and now you pick him? Whoops. Oh, who's gone down here? Kassar. No, I thought it was Sandy Kassar for a minute. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, NetApp boys as well has gone Dominic down. Roland. It's uh, Dominic Roland, yes. Roland and uh, Cesare Benedetti. have just touched the wheel going into that hairpin. Dominic Roland. <laughs> I want a bike! Canadian rider used to ride for um, Cervelo. Ooh, that was a bit nasty. So he must have got fairly tangled with Benedetti, and that's why Erica Greenedge want to keep control of it. Let's have a look in the middle of the peloton. That's so why we're there, we probably won't see it very easily. No, nope, they've just uh, collided with each other at that point. Nobody else going down but uh, Cesare Benedetti and Dominic Rolla thumping into each other. Uh, yes, going back to the Toyo Boss thing, uh, you know, we say what we we say what we see, unfortunately. He just hasn't uh, managed to perform to the level, but on his finish like this, I think he's good for it, so that's the way it is. Three rubber bank riders up here. Team Sky have one, two, three, four, five, a lot of them behind Mark uh, at this point, having to move up to sort out the train. And Bernard Eisel and will be uh, beginning to, and Juan Antonio Fletcher will bark the orders, make sure everybody get in the right place at the right time. They seem a little bit out of position, Sean, where uh, they've still got time. They're still just about eight kilometres out. Yes, a little bit uh, of a scatter on the Sky Riders, but when you're backing off and you're not riding on the front, uh, it's difficult to hold everybody together in line because riders start pushing in between and uh, you get a little bit, you know, uh, s s scattered in the front of the bunch and uh, that is uh, always difficult, but uh, again, it's... Uh, the Sky has been making the calculation that they're trying to hold off. We can see that in the last number of kilometres. They're very much there, but uh, they don't want to take it on the front. As we can see now, they're getting organised and they're starting to come more to the front here. Um, and that seems to be the tactic. And, uh, you know, some days you look at the final run in and you say, well, guys, you have to be careful here. It's straight, the last number of kilometres. We have to have a number of men there together to keep the pace real high. Uh, so you make your calculation when you look at the route book and uh, Sky are still just holding off there for the moment and uh, keeping their men it's together. And uh, still with seven kilometres, there's uh, quite it's a long... scrappy here, this one. It's still got a long way to go. Pushing the pace along at the front here, Sean. Movistar and uh, Robert Hunter. Seems maybe he's a little bit nervous. But the control that Orica Greenedge had there just disappeared all of a sudden. I think they wanted to control it into that that uh, climb and in that uh, little tricky descent. And then maybe just wondering where Matt Goss is here, getting him back together and uh, sorting it out for the finish. Yes, and I think uh, Goss would like it just to be a little bit off the... Uh, full gas on the climb here as we can see some miles are going to the attack and it was the uh, Moby Star rider who just upped the pace there and put everybody in a little bit of difficulty Well AG2 Isle and Mondial have had a dire season so far, they haven't had a single win and trying to get away following on the hot on the hills there is uh, Vermont, the Belgian rider and three riders. I think the front rider is Bellini. So Fellini and uh, the AG2R rider, I think, is uh, Ben Gastar, the uh, Luxembourg rider. That's uh, Fabio Fellini. A uh, good little move. Or oh, Julien Berra, it is. That's what they've got down there. 
Julian Berra, who's been in one breakaway already. Fabio Fellin is the rider at the back here from Androni. And uh, Vermont, the rider from Quick Step at the front. Julian uh, Vermont. That's about all the only chance they've got, Sean. It's that sort of real classic time to give it a go, isn't it? It was just as the peloton is a little bit slower on the tiniest of uh, hills. Let's give it a go. We haven't got anything to lose. Let's uh, pile on the pressure and see if we can get away. Yes, it's an opportunity uh, as the pace was, you know, uh, knocked off a base uh, on a little bit of a climb there, throw in an attack and uh, uh, have a go. But again, you know, it's going to be difficult to hold off a big bunch of riders unless they can real work together and if you get three real good super strong riders there is a possibility but at the moment we can see you know it's uh, it's being controlled by the sprinters teams on the front of the bunch Julien Vermont uh, trying to drive away at the front here five kilometers to go and these three riders who put in a little dig over the top of that tiny little rise as the pace slackened off. Oh, I'm never going to stay away. Vermont eases up. Feline goes. And already Julien Berard has decided that's not going to happen. And uh, it's Navodowskis on the front for Garmin Barracuda. And Robert Hunter just nestling behind a whole line of sky riders on the left hand side is the uh, will be the nominated sprinter now or is the sprinter for Garmin Barracuda because they've got nothing nobody else Tyler Farah has uh, gone home already and uh, Farnese Vini up here with just the three men Andrea Guardini is their real sprint powerhouse he's a good sprinter and has won an absolute hatful of stages in races like the Tour of Lankawi, but if it goes up and there are hills in the stage, he finds a real problem with it. And here comes Saxo Bank towards the front. Greg Henderson's pick for the day. JJ Hado will be the man they're looking for, but he's a little bit off the pace at the moment, Sean. He's going to have to get himself into the right position. Yes. Um, they peeled off already because he's not there. Yes, well, I think there's uh, still 3.8 kilometers to go. Um, with this run in, if you... Uh, if you're a little bit off, you can you know, make up a bit of ground. But again, if you have to do it on your own, that is always going to be a difficult one. Uh, we see Garmin really pushing it on there for a moment. And I presume it's for Hunter. But again, they have others. You know, Rustler is also quite good at the finish. Rasmussen, how fast is he? Because we haven't had a good run yes, in where it's very flat. And this one is, you know, from here on, it's uh, pretty, you know, pretty flat there's nothing anything that can cause problems for the big sprinters and maybe Masrusen he might feel that in this sort of finish he could have a better chance this is always a difficult time we've got three kilometers to go and everybody's fighting to stay in position at the front as AG2R bring up uh, Balletti Manuel Balletti former Colnago rider towards the front there's Hado sitting in the back of the Saxo Bank train JJ Hado his brother Lucas is here as well. Three kilometres to go. And it's just straight, straight, a bit more straight, followed by some straight into a straight finish now. The Saxo Bank have taken this one up quite early, and I think uh, Sky might be quite pleased about that. Oh, Orica Green Edge getting a little bit caught out there. Very tight bend. And all that work being done by Rabobank, Sean, for nothing at the moment. Yes, um, looks like Renshaw's the only man up there. Only man here on the wheel of Cavendish, and uh, you know they were uh, doing a lot of driving four or five kilometres back, which was uh, very very early to do that, and uh, now they've all disappeared. Well, there goes my uh, th choice for the day, Theo Boss, unless he can work his way up uh, to the wheel of uh, Mark Renshaw. But again, I think it's all down to positioning and uh, bike handling at speed in a bunch once again. And pos sure. possibly uh, the last number of days, you know, uh, yeah, dig out, digging into his reserves and fatigue is a big problem. Yep, very much so. Todd Sato is drilling it on the front here. Had his birthday during this Giro d'Italia, 38 years of age. is a very high pace for JJ Hado, who's in a big gear, ready to, be, to get out of the slipstream there. And Sky decide we're going to take this one over. As Todd Sato looks around him, it's a good job he's an experienced rider. 
pulls over, but Sky were coming on the right hand side. Renshaw still hanging on in there. Matthew Goss has still got two, one man ahead of him, but Balletti, I think, is on his wheel for AG to Le Mondial. Sky take it up at the front with just over a kilometer to go. The last man in the line who will release Mark Cavendish is Garand Thomas. There he is, you can see him. Just ahead of that uh, is uh, Peter Kenyuk. The red jersey of the points leader, Mark Cavendish. He's in a perfect position at the moment. Roberto Ferrari is coming from nowhere by the look of it into the center of your shot. And Nizzolo is riding on his wheel for Radio Shack in the black and red and white in the middle of the shot. Oriket Green Edge are trying to fight to find some place for Matthew Goss and they found some in the center now and Hunter, Hunter sprinting style gets under the rear wheel of Matthew Goss. Nizzolo leads out on the left hand side of the shot. Hunter is in the middle, he's fighting to get onto uh, Goss's wheel. They still not get released him yet and Mark Cavendish is behind Robert Hunter using him as the slingshot to get out. It's going to be a very fast finish. I think actually it's Feline in this group rather than uh, Roberto Ferrari. Now they drive to the line. Matthew Goss is going to be scrappy. Is there going to be a pile up here? Oh, I hope not. Mark Cavendish comes through. It's going to be neck and neck. Cavendish takes it. Cavendish in the end pulled out a bike length. I think from Christoph. And the other man was Sasha Modelo, who came through very, very fast indeed. I thought for a minute, Sean, they were going to push up right against that barrier on the left-hand side of the road. But in the end, they just pulled out from it. And Mark Cavendish accelerated again. He can engage that gear once more and pulled out a clear bike length over his nearest rivals. Yes, and it looked like that uh, Mark Cavendish was a little bit uh, boxed in there for a moment, but uh, he got the opening and when he uh, got to uh, go for his sprint, well then uh, he was, uh, you know, that bike length, uh, bike length and a half immediately on everybody else. And that, my friends, is why we talk about Mark Cavendish. Let's have a look from overhead. Garen Thomas is the last man in line, Mark Cavendish in the red jersey in the black shorts, points leader behind him, Mark Renshaw, and I think it is Feline on his right hand side. Coming over the top of Feline, who doesn't have any response for this, is the Orica Green Edge train. Now they start to move. Gossi is neck and neck with Cavendish at this point. Hunter gets in on the act here in the uh, South African champions jersey, goes around the front of Cav, who thinks, aye aye, an extra man, I'll just tack on the back of that. Goss is still to be released and they're very hard up on the left by this point. Hunter goes behind Matt Goss. Renshaw on the far right hand side and look he just takes the gas and he steps off the gas and he can still accelerate. Mark Cavendish, he steps off the gas to avoid a little bit of a collision. No problem with that, it's Christoph who comes through for second. Third for Renshaw, Modelo gets fourth. Well, look, you see there, he stepped off the gas, and for some significant time, Sean, that wasn't just a little step off the gas, he had to freewheel for a bit there. He is quite amazing, the way he can engage some sort of gear that the other sprinters don't seem to have. Christoph for Itera. Guardini coming on the right-hand side of your screen. But Mark Cavendish takes another win, extends his points lead. Well, a good uh, straight sprint in the end, Sean. I thought there might have been a little bit uh, coming up on the barrier there, but you could saw, you just saw the way this man, uh, Cavendish, just backed off and uh, managed to re-accelerate through the gap. Yes, uh, a little bit... Uh just boxed in there and uh, I think it was Ulrika Greenage who came with uh, a train very fast and uh, you know closed him off a bit and we could see he was looking to the right and then he decided to go to the left and had to knock off the gas for a moment at you know 65 kilometers per hour but when he got the opening and took it up you know you could see it's just amazing the uh, the sudden up of speed that he has in that final 200 meters. Well, a proper straight line sprint that one uh, Sean you got you picked the right one and uh, I've got to say that uh, Greg and myself no no we're near here we are Sebastian Lucas was better Arnold Demare gets seventh 
Uh, Matt Gossett, six. Uh, Favili came through. Sasha Modolo gets um, fourth. That doesn't nothing look right. Uh, fifth. We'll have a check about that. Mark Renshaw gets third. Well, a very short stage today, 121 kilometers. And it came to a, a straight, flat-out sprint. Lots of teams wanting to try and get something out of it. But really, you know, in the end, it's come down to the best sprinter in this race. It is Mark Cavendish. He extends his lead in the points classification, takes another stage victory, and notches up another one on his Palmares, becoming uh, ever-extending. Here we go. Joaquim Rodriguez still leads by 17 seconds over a rider. High Jadal. Uh, to uh, Sandy Casar at 26, then Terralongo, Santaramita, Kreuziger, Benyat in Chausti, and Ivan Vaso. Well, tomorrow it's totally different. Different set of riders we'll see tomorrow. A brilliant win for Mark Cavendish, rounding off uh, a whole 10 days where the sprinters have been able to do something. Uh, Good afternoon to you. Yes. The Giro starts here for those people who really want to win the Tour of Italy. It's stage 14. These are live images from the top of the finish at uh, Cervinia. 206 kilometers after they started in uh, Carrasco. They will finish up in the miserably damp and uh, drizzly climb at Cervinia. But this is what happened yesterday, the last uh, time we'll probably see the big big sprint finishes mark cavendish took another win he was the man of the day but these two men went out on the breakaway olivier uh, kites and had had the fuga longa prize the uh, fuga pinarello but it was martin kites uh, of vacon soleil the last man to be dragged back in who added a whole load more to his uh, breakaway total in the end sky took up position at about 1.4 kilometers to go trying to bring mark cavendish home but got a little bit crowded out just showing the class of cavendish as a rider you're a little boxed in and could still accelerate out of it to take another win in the points jersey it was a fantastic win for cavendish and for sky finally i went and i went to go on the left of goss i seen a small gap he could have easily just shut the door on me that would have been uh, perfectly reasonable to do but you know he's a He's a super good guy, we're really good friends, and uh, I think he wants a fair sprint, you know, so uh, he opened the door and we were able to, to sprint fairly, you know, so. And indeed it was another win for Mark Cavendish. Joaquim Rodriguez keeps the pink jersey of overall leader. The question is, will he do that by the end of today? As I say, it all starts today. Joaquim Rodriguez has an... 17 second gap over Ryder Heijdal and 26 seconds over Sandy Kassar. Well, it all starts today in the mountains, as you can see. The Italian Alps are our destination today. It's always the place that makes or breaks the. Giro d'Italia, Joaquim Rodriguez has shown he's good already, but this is a completely different kettle of fish to his stage win. It's not the first mountain stage, the uh, second one, we've already had a different mountain stage. Uh, but tomorrow it will be cold, and that's one of our enemies, but uh, I hope we'll overcome the, uh, you know, the weather conditions. I think uh, Liquid Gas will uh, probably control the race. Well, Liquid Gas have tried to do so on pretty much all of the stages so far. Only a couple out of everything we've had so far have not been dominated by the Liquid Gas boys at the front in terms of pacemaking. I don't think this is a uh, particularly difficult stage to control. We have the climb of Jou and a uh, very good downhill. And the uh, final climb of Cervinia is about 2,000 metres high. I think we're, we're pretty well prepared. Well, even, uh, Ivan is in good condition for the last uh, kilometres at the end. Yeah, it's a tactical race. And of course you've got to have the legs. Uh, Ivan knows this finish and uh, climb 
Uh, well, it's an important occasion. Well, we did have some terrible weather on the Giro d'Italia last year, and you can see uh, that it really plays havoc with some of the riders. This was uh, Alberto Contador going away. As for Joaquim Rodriguez, he says, uh, usually I'm not so bad in the cold. Well, I hope it's not snowing. We'll see. We'll just keep fingers crossed. Well, Joaquim Rodriguez, he'll see whether he has the legs today. This is the finish line at uh, Cervinia. Pretty nasty, huh? It's not the climb that's going to be the problem for some of the riders. It's going to be the cold. It's sort of sleety drizzle. And it's going to be that run down off the first category climb that precedes this final one. Cervinia finishes on the first category climb. The Col de Joux then runs down into Châtelon. And that will be the testing time for some of the men, especially Domenico Pozzavivo, his uh, team manager. Bruno Reverberi was in uh, L'Equipe this morning, the French sporting paper, saying, and they said, what does, Dom, what does uh, Pozzavivo fear? And it's exactly what he said, the cold, the rain, and going downhill. Uh, he wasn't lying about it. And it's going to be a difficult day for Domenico Pozzavivo. Welcome back. Look at that. Four degrees. Nasty, nasty, nasty. It's cleared off a tiny bit at the finish at Cervinia today, but after 206 kilometers, they will finish on the first category climb. 15 points on offer for the climb itself, and there's 15 points on offer for the Col de Joux before that as well. But uh, it's all about looking to see today who is marking who, who is watching who, who has got the legs, and who hasn't. There may be one or two of the outside favourites, or even the big favourites today, who are put under enough pressure to say, well, they may not win the Giro d'Italia after all. Running straight into the Italian Alps, as you can see. This is what it looks like. Welcome to the real race here on the Giro d'Italia. Col de Joux, then the run down into Châtelon, and then up to over 2,000 metres, finishing at Cervinia, and that is where all these riders are heading today. And it starts this morning. Maybe a date for this man here, Mikhail Golash, because he's holding the mountains classification jersey, but it's unlikely he'll have it by the end of the day. Caruso, the best young rider, will he hold the jersey at the end of the day? Will this man, Joaquim Rodriguez, still be in the pink jersey? And this man, Mark Cavendish, he says he's going to go all the way, but will it be the case that he's within the time limit today? Who knows? All four jerseys under pressure today in one way or another. And away we go. Starting this morning, overcast, but uh, dry, but as they head into the mountains, it's going to be difficult. And it was nervous after the start because the first 50, uh, 60, nearly 70 kilometers were run at over 50 kilometers an hour. Finally, a breakaway, st pushing away, getting away, and just look at the conditions now. We'll tell you who is in the breakaway. Mathieu Monteguti, AG3 Le Mondial, De Marchi of Androni, we've seen him before, De Negri, Alfarnese Vini likewise, Olivia Kaysen wanting to clearly try and get back that uh, top spot in the uh, Fuga Pinarello prize, the escape prize, he initiated the break today, uh, Andre Amador again in a break, Nicholas Mace of Omega Pharma Quickstep, and Nelson Oliveria of Radio Shack Nissan. The man you're watching on your screen is Jan Barta. And so well in Terreno Adriatico, the uh, Czech rider. The gap is 14 minutes and 34 seconds. Well, that is exactly what... Uh, well, that, uh, that's exactly what the gap that Jan Barta needs. 12.56 is what they have over the peloton. Jan Barter, uh, the best placed man in the breakaway at 14.34 and a good move to get in today because the favourites will be marking each other. Sean is in the uh, commentary seat beside me once again. Sean, today this is where the real race starts. We've seen some spectacular sprinting, we've seen some great racing, some great places, but today is where you start winning or losing the Giro. Well, today is the day where we will see the uh 
the real race for the general classification the men who are not uh, in as good shape as they would like to be as we maybe expect them to be or we think they are uh, we will see that today big mountain stage in the end and you know 22 kilometers of a climb the first one and uh, then that final difficult climb 27 k's to the finish in the last 68 k's uh, you know you have that uh, huge amount of climbing so it's going to be a big test today and it's going to give us a pretty clear picture uh, who is capable of winning this race uh, in a week's time um, with such a difficult week to come and the weather conditions is going to be uh, uh, difficult to adapt for some riders we've had really good weather in this race for two weeks now perfect weather for racing in the last number of days six seven days ago it was a little bit too warm a bit uncomfortable but it's better that than what we're getting today at the moment we can see it's wet it's not raining a lot but as you know when you go to that altitude and the uh col de Jou, 1640 meters the descent of that is 18 kilometers long mm. you know you can get very cold and some riders do not support that weather and then when you hit the final climb which is 27 kilometers as i say if you get cold on the first climb of the day well then you can have real difficulty in the beginning of the final climb and it's all dependent on the rain as well if the rain holds off it's not too bad but if it starts to rain and riders get cold well then we could see some riders having major difficulty and i mean the favorites in this yeah, race absolutely uh, riders who are not particularly good at supporting cold weather let's start with the obvious one his team manager, Bruno Everberi, already saying in the papers, Sean, that Domenico Pozzavivo hates this weather. Yes, uh, well, he's noted for that. He hates the cold weather, and I think uh, part of that hate as well, uh, if you're in mountain stages and you have descents, he hates that more so. Uh, so he is a double, a double whammy here today. If it does get really cold and that descent off the Col de Joux, uh, he's going to you know, have difficulty on that one with the wet streets. He doesn't like it at all. But there's many others. I think uh, you know, Frank Schleck, he doesn't, lo- no, he doesn't, he doesn't like, like the uh, difficult, co- the cold conditions, especially when it changes suddenly. And unfortunately today has changed just a totally wrong day going into the mountains. If we had it two days ago on the flat, you have a bit more time, the body to adapt to the colder conditions. But here, big altitude, as I said, Col de Joux, 1640, and the final climb it's over 2,000 metres so it's going to be cold very very cold out there and as I said Schleck is another one Gadre I'd be a little bit concerned about him as well he's a very lightweight rider and uh, if it really gets cold and it does rain a lot uh, before the, uh, the, the descent of Col de Joux well then we could see some major problems for some of the big favourites how much does it build up in your mind, Sean, for a rider like Podzivivo? Basso, again, is another one who's not particularly happy in the, uh, the cold, miserable conditions, although less of a problem for him than some of the others. Uh, Rodriguez said he's not too bad in the cold. How much does it play on your mind? You're, you're making your way towards the mountains. You could see it coming up ahead of you. The rain is starting to lash down upon you, just drizzle on you, which is even worse, actually. Uh, this constant stream of stuff. How much does it play on your mind knowing that you've got that long descent coming on the other side? Does it get to you? Well, it does uh, It does play in our mind, certainly, because a big day uh, on the good conditions, as we've been having all this Giro, uh, you, uh, you're you always concerned a little bit that you might not be on the best of a day. Everybody is a little bit worried about that. You come from almost two weeks on the flat, flat racing, big gears, and then you go into this situation where it's long, long climbs, uh, climbing gear, which you have to change the rhythm totally. And even the best of riders have, you know, difficulties in that. You're always a little bit concerned on the first day in the mountains. But throw in the conditions we've got today, it makes it worse again. And if you're a little bit uh, prone to not uh, supporting the cold conditions, well, then it's another added pressure on you. And... It's going to be, you know, big pressure for some of the riders, as we said. Pozo Vivo, of course, because he doesn't like the cold, but also the descents is a major problem when you have the wet roads. And as you said, Basso as well, maybe not the best one, but I think he can survive. Uh, Schleck is the one which I would be concerned about because sometimes he has difficulty adapting. And there's, you know, a number of riders there might have some difficulty today just adapting to the big, the big temperature change. We've entered this series of uh, forts. We saw one of them then. Actually, we missed Bard, which is a bit of a shame, just down the, the road. All these series of string of forts along the ridge here. Uh, they've sort of been in the same position since Roman times, pretty much. But really, as you can see with that one, 
reinforced just before the Napoleonic period. All this area was broken up. Uh, the House of Savoy and the uh, uh, Napoleonic armies coming in. It's been fought over for a long, long time. Key strategic area, this. This pass along up to and over the Alps. This is right at the back of the peloton. 12 minutes and 22 seconds. Some riders without rain jackets on, but a miserable day today in the saddle. He has a gap of 14 minutes and 34 seconds to make up if he wants to go into the virtual lead of this race. And 12 minutes and 2 seconds is the gap that he has over the pink jersey group, the Grupo Maglia Rosa. A miserable day today. And what a change we've had from the last two or three days. They are on the Col de Joux. Very long climb, 22.4 kilometers, rises up to 1,640 meters. And they're just uh, riding into the wind here and into the rain. It's not particularly strong wind or particularly strong rain, but really miserable. If suddenly you come from uh, hot, pleasant conditions for riding a bicycle, and suddenly you enter up in the mountains, and it's the change sometimes, as Sean has often pointed out, that is very difficult, not just the fact that it's raining, the, the physical change in temperature and type of weather. Some riders can support it, some riders can't. There'll be a few heavy hearts today. Uh, the talk was at the start all of what the weather would be like, even last night, what the weather would be like. And Sean, they would have been looking, studying the uh, medium range and short range weather forecast very, very carefully indeed uh, for this day today. And for the week, in fact. Yes, well, they would be studying it, and um, the teams would be looking uh, yesterday and the, uh, the previous couple of days how the weather was looking, and especially for the riders, I think, and the teams that don't like the conditions. They have riders who uh, just dread the conditions we're getting today, so they would be definitely looking at it. But, uh, you know, uh, unlucky, really, in this race because we've had such great weather, and now it comes into the big mountain stage, the first real big test, and here we go, bad weather conditions. And, uh, you know, it's going to test the riders' mental powers as well because that's what makes, I suppose, a big stage race mm. rider. You have to be able to fight for three days on the flat for the past two weeks, fighting there in the final of the stages with all the sprinters when it's going at 60k per hour to hold your place in the front with your teammates uh, into those crazy finishes which we've been having. Uh, and, uh, you know, you get into your terrain then and suddenly the weather conditions come down and it's not favourable at all. And uh, you have just to dig deep. Uh, you have to, you know, keep your concentration, not lose your morale. And that's uh, it's that's what makes big champions and riders capable of winning big stage races. Of course, you have to have that ability as well. You have to have the ability to be able to climb, to be able to, you know, race over three weeks, time trial, all of that. But still, when you get these conditions, mm. you know, the mental part as well is a big, big part. Did you ever arrive at a stage race? Uh, change like this, Sean, where it suddenly got into a dreadfully bad conditions and, and, and found it very difficult to, to deal with. I mean, you were particularly known for being mentally tough, but did you, did you ever remember an occasion where something drastically changed overnight weather-wise and it played on your mind? Well, uh, first of all, I support the, the bad weather conditions very well, so it made it a bit easier. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't love the conditions. A lot of people say, oh, Kelly, he loved these conditions. When he looked out in the morning, he pulled the curtains, it was raining. He was, you know, cheering and shouting. It was never the case. And I do but remember... It's not bad making you, your rivals think that. Uh, no, well, no, the rivals knew that. They knew I could support the conditions. Uh -huh. They could see the way I was riding in the events, and they knew my uh, fourth day points, I suppose. And in the bad conditions, I was able to support it really well. And and I remember one year I was doing, uh, we used to do Tour of Flanders and then that evening you take a flight to Spain for the Pays Bats which started on the Monday. And I remember um, when Van der Aden won the Tour of Flanders, it was real bad conditions, very, very wet and cold in the end. And uh, I had a difficult day. Then we took a flight to, to Pays Basque and the following morning I woke up, I pulled the curtains and it was just sheeting down with rain. And at that point I said, oh my God, not again. So in times like that, you say to yourself, it's hard, you know, to yeah. it's, hard, it's hard to take it after being in a tour of Flanders for 260 days, 260 k's mm. the previous mm. day. But I think, uh, you know, I, I I supported it quite well, so that made it a bit easier for me to uh, 
to take a bad while when, it, uh, when, when we were getting it. And how much is, as, as a big name contender for something like the Giro d'Italia or Tour of Spain or a Tour de France or whatever it is, when you see weather conditions like this surrounding you and you know some of your main rivals don't support it so well, how much do you turn the screw? Well, I think, uh, first of all, you have to see on the stage. And uh, if you uh, look at today's route, today's stage, and you look at the route book and you see you have two big climbs in the end, uh, you, you first of all get into the climb and see how you're feeling yourself. And if you're feeling good and you can see around you that some of the other favourites not uh, in the best of shape, you can maybe try something with your team. There's also the other riders who are talking about were a little bit outsiders for the general classification and Pozzoviva, who we mentioned. Today is an opportunity to put him under pressure because he is a danger man at this point in the race at uh, only 1.12 down in general classification. Like if you allow him to get through today and the weather clears up again, you know, it becomes more of a danger. So I'd not be surprised if you know some of the favourites who are feeling good, they have some teammates with him after this uh, first climb of the day. They could really push on the descent and trying to, you know, put Puzzle Vivo a little bit further outward before we get on to the final climb. And that's one major name maybe a bit further back and uh, take him out of the general classification a bit more, knock a few minutes into him today. Branislav Samalo is the rider on your screen. Let's remind you that there is a break out the road. You can see 11 minutes 32 seconds. Monteguti of AG2 Ala Mondial. De Marchi of Androni. De Negri of Farnese Vini. Olivier Kaysen of uh, Lotto Belasop. Amador of Movistar. Nicholas Mace of Omega Pharma Quickstep. Olivier, uh, Olivier of uh, Radio Shack Nissan. And Jan Barter is the man who's just pushed a little way ahead of uh, Oliveira. Nice and uh, Kaysen here, the uh, remaining men who are trying to chase this man. Jan Bartos has had a very, very good season so far. They must be pretty happy with him in the car of uh, Netta, that's for sure. Bit of housekeeping. Matthew Goss didn't start this morning, neither did Mark Renshaw. Shows you what we mean by the last week. This is uh, now a week for the uh, Big climbers and the overall favourites. We understand JJ Hado and Brett Lancaster also out of the Giro d'Italia. Now, unsurprisingly, Hado, another sprinter, doesn't like this sort of stuff at all. Lancaster's done his job for Matthew Goss. He'll uh, be off uh, training for the Tour, as Matt Goss is. That's what he said. Well, our eyes are now on the Tour de France. But Mark Cavendish has started this morning in the points leader's jersey. Gave a video interview yesterday, which we saw, or which I saw anyway, on the web saying uh, he wants to take the battle for the points jersey all the way to the finish uh, in Milan. And, uh, Sean, it's a bit, that's a big task for him because there's points available at the top of each mountain and for him to struggle over for the next opportunity to gain some points is a big, big task for him. Well, when you look at that uh, classification, um, it's going to be a big uh, task for him uh, to... Uh to hold on to the points jersey because there's riders there um, you know who uh, who can pick up points on stages like today and uh, they would be the ones you know uh, who can climb very well because there's a lot of them they are very close in that classification you, know, you have Pozzo Vivo you have Rodriguez who was there you have uh, uh, you have Heisdal who's up there, you have Tia Longo, they're mm. all you know, not that far off. I know they're 25, 30 points down, but still, you know, in the next days, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for the guys to pick up points, where for Mark Cavendish, uh, it's not going to be easy. Uh, he's going to have to you know, calculate his effort and see in the intermediate sprints if he can put up, pick up some points there uh, on some of the stages. But again, it's going to be a big battle. It's not... Uh, it's not an easy week for the sprinters at all, and the opportunities now f all the way from here to the end next Sunday, they're very, very little for the sprinters. Mm, absolutely. This is the head of the race. Jan Barta is the uh, rider you are looking at. A terrific early season sprung, a bit of a surprise. Early on in the season, this man, he's ridden for Netta for the last uh, three years. Before that, he was with the Austrian Elk House team. We've seen them a couple of times, but not uh, on big, big races. He won uh, Settimana Coppie Bartoli earlier this year. A very, very good uh, race indeed. He won the uh, individual time trial. Took it away for some very big names. 
third overall in the Tour of Britain last year as well, Jan Barta, so he's got plenty of talent. He's a tough guy as well. Michal Kolasz, the Polish rider holding the Mountains classification jersey. Sean, uh, the first, uh, first uh, jersey that seems under pressure today, uh, certainly uh, from Race Radio telling us, is that Michal Kolasz is beginning to slip off the back of the main peloton here. Yes, well, um, as we talked about uh, before we came on air, if he can get into a breakaway and pick up some points, that is his only uh, opportunity or only possibility to hold on to the mountain classification jersey. Otherwise, waiting in the bunch, I don't think he's capable of doing that. He is very strong on the short tough climbs, not so steep, but when he gets onto the long climbs, as we can see, you know, he's in difficulty at this moment. And for the bunch, they still have about uh, plus 10 kilometres of this climb to go, so... Um, I think he's had uh, he's had the glory in his jersey and it's going to be over for today Thomas and uh, Kenya not exactly revelling in the weather here, that's Alessandro De Marchi getting a gilet on it's cold enough here Sean to have the gilet here before they even start running down the other side yes uh, that tells as you go up the altitude the temperature dropping and guys just wrapping up on the climb that tells us getting cold ten minutes and 57 the gap is coming down very slightly they're only about a halfway up this cold as you climb and once again it's liquid gas controlling here at the front just as most uh, pundits and director sportive said they would Sean Yes, controlling uh, very early, but of course Basil likes the uh, a good tempo on the climb on the long ones like this, uh, 22k. Uh, if it uh, goes slowly in the bunch, well then there could be attacks, and he doesn't like that. So Liquor Gas setting the pace for Basil the way he likes to climb. Mikhail Kolash. A couple of bottles for David Bramati, director sportive there. And they're suffering along with a number of riders. Looks like Brian uh, Bulgak just behind him. And the raincoat. And the raincoat as well, yep. We managed to catch up with Damian Okunago earlier today. And hopefully we'll have him in uh, just a second. 11 minutes and three is the gap from our breakaway riders. Back to the main peloton. Noi di Team Lampre siamo molto concentrati. Eh, uh, going to be very focused. Una grande sfida, grande atmosfera it's anche a da big parte challenge, a big atmosphere for us. So, uh, and, but for all our opponents as well. So uh, the last uh, climb is very long, but not very difficult. We know that in modern cycling, you need to escape a uh, long way to get a gap. What's happened to you? Well, there are very long and steady climbs. They're not uh, particularly demanding slopes. You have to stay with your opponents. Uh, so attacks will be very uh, far away. It'll be difficult to, uh, today or maybe tomorrow. Uh, we saw a little bit of rain this morning. Uh, there's some at the top. Will it change things? Well, the weather's very uncertain, says Damiano. We, we don't know it'll be raining or not at the moment, but if it rains... It will be an advantage for us and we'll try and take an advantage from it. Uh, do you agree, Sean? Why will it be a particular advantage? Scarponi and Kuniger, riders who can, uh, uh, who, who can um, support, as you would say, these things a little bit more? Well, it seems to be. Um, and uh, we know Scarponi, he can ride good in the uh, bad weather conditions, the cold conditions. Uh, Kunego himself, I think he supported OK. And the way he's talking there, it doesn't seem to be... Uh, a problem for the uh, men from Lamprey. Not at all. Liquid Gas must be nervous though today though, because they controlled the pace of the peloton for nigh on all the uh, Giro d'Italia. Ivan Basso wants to win this for a third time. He's won in 2006, 2010. He'd like to take another one here, 2012. Uh, and this year is a pretty prime year for it. it um, with the absence of Alberto Contador, there's a whole new atmosphere to the race. They've got new challenges in the shape of people like Domenico Pozzivivo, but uh, still a very good chance. Suits him the course here, Sean. And uh, Liquid Gas have been, not nervy, but they've been laying out their intention all the way through. Yes, well, uh, 
Basso has been preparing quietly at the beginning of the year and uh, he's coming in this Giro. Um, it looks like that he's in good shape, seems to be coming good only the last number of weeks and that is a good uh, time to get, uh, get your form uh, start getting it because in a three week tour if you've been going well in the Ardennes Classics five weeks ago four weeks ago well then it's difficult to continue on and hold that real good shape right through uh, a Giro which is three li- three weeks long um, but again how good is Basso going to be is he good enough is he going to be the best of the favourites here to be able to win it and as you say David you know to win this Tour of Italy liquid gas if they can win it with Basso well for Basso then the season is good and you know uh, the way things are going for Basso he is going to give it you know 100% here and uh, he has been really on his game here the team has been really good f- with him uh, keeping him out of danger and uh, they're continuing on today they're the ones who are setting the pace and he likes this as we can see he's sitting here just behind uh, two or three teammates he likes that pace just to wear down everybody mm. else keep working at it and uh, that steady strong pace on the climb he's really good at that and the team are doing a good job for the moment but how good will they be can they continue on doing that for the next number of days that is the question as well because they have done some on the flat I wouldn't be concerned about that but if they start the first day of the mountains and they have a week to go uh, if they have to do this every day it's going to be a big big ask see Frank Schleck on the far right in the bottom right hand box it was you see Frank Schleck there on your screen in the uh, black and red and white of Radio Shack Nissan on the left hand side of the peloton second to back of those types is that brave and hardy souls it's getting do warm something. I should do something about their underpants taste though look at that that's pretty poor um, Jan Barter is getting warm I <laughs> just heard you say that <laughs> Jan Barter clearly uh, doesn't mind the uh, poor conditions. Uh, Frank Schleckin sitting in the peloton didn't look particularly happy sitting behind one teammate and right up towards the front, Sean. He, uh, they, he prefers this sort of pace of climbing as well, but he doesn't like this weather much. No, I don't think he would. Uh, he wouldn't like this weather. He'd certainly like to have the weather conditions we've had, uh, had the last three or four days, which is, you know, perfect for racing, 19, 20 degrees. Uh, that would be just uh, lovely conditions for a lot of riders and certainly for Frank Schleck he would you know, like the drier conditions the descent as well is something that he doesn't like and you know, this descent we have coming here uh, later on is going to be a bit you know, dangerous when we have the wet conditions mm. so uh, it's an 18k descent and some of it is pretty technical and if somebody really push it on Schleck is not going to be looking forward to this descent yeah, but I'm not sure they will uh, with liquid gas controlling it because Basso is a, is a fair descender, but he, uh, he wouldn't like to really push it out in these sort of conditions. And uh, it's going to have to take somebody who's got a very aggressive mentality, I think, Sean, to say, right, I'm going to go and streaming down this other side. Maybe some of the guys who want to go for the stage victory today but aren't a massive threat in the overall, maybe they might push on a little bit to get into the bottom of the final climb of the day with some sort of advantage. But you need a big advantage on such a long, long, long climb. I, I, I don't know. I think Liquid Gas may just control it all the way down. Well, uh as you say, somebody who is thinking about the stage can push on, and if anybody push on the descent, well then, everybody wants to follow, um, and you can be sure as well, if somebody from the, uh, go, thinking of a stage victory wants to go on, there's a few men there in the general classification uh, who are looking for a place in the end of this race, uh, they can decide to descend quite well, like a cruising guy, I think he, mm. can, he can descend yes, pretty, he can. pretty well. Uh, Scaponi can do it quite well also so there's always you know some guys from the general classification uh, if somebody do start pushing it on they will follow and that's where the riders who do not like the descent who are very nervous on the wet roads will be getting to difficulty yeah, riders right like uh, Bajaski the pole and maybe Rigoberto Oran is another rider who might well have a go at uh, fast descent here Maybe a rider like a Thomas de Ghent, Sean, who's only at two minutes and three seconds back. Um, he may chance his arm and, and give it a push today. Well, These sort of riders, isn't it? As, as we know, Thomas de Ghent, uh, he's capable of attacking anywhere. Uh, we've seen him you know, in the final of a race when there's a breakaway of five or six riders. You're only riding for the minor places, and he still attacks in the final. So he is very capable if he can, you know, 
stay in this group here which is climbing quite well the longer mm. climbs might be a bit difficulty for him because uh, the short ones when I say short I suppose uh, six seven kilometers he can get up them uh, but when we get to the ones which you know are 20 plus kilometers then he might have difficulty but if he's here uh, at the top of this climb he's the one who is very capable of pushing on the descent mm. I'm not sure we know whether he's got a uh a difficulty with these long, long climbs as he seems to be steadily improving and this might be his first chance for us to see just exactly how well he's going. Jan Barter here, winner of the uh, Settimana Copier Bartley, a very important race, Sean, and he took some big scalps there early in the year. Well, he is. Uh, he's riding well. I mean, you see the results he've had this year and, uh, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's a really good rider, a class rider, and... Uh, uh, at the moment, uh, the way he's riding out here in front, um, <clears throat> I, I don't understand really because the other uh, breakaway, there's about five of them chasing there and they were at about, uh, you know, 30 seconds at a moment there. Um, when you look at the distance to go on that, um, I ask why does he go away so early? If he could stay with this group and start, you know, to ride together a bit, I think we have fought four chasers now maybe. So uh, he's really keen to push on, but he's... It's uh, a long way, you know, f when he went it was well over 60 kilometres to go and now we're still at 52 kilometres to the finish and when you look at the advantage, you know, 10 minutes, uh, it's a nice advantage at this moment if they could maybe work a bit together uh, on the climb and uh, get to the final climb with 7 or 8 minutes, well then there'd be, uh, there'd be a possibility of staying all the way to the end. Jan Barter, the face and riding style of a backstreet pugilist. He looks like a tough nut when he takes those helmet and glasses off and he clearly likes uh, staying out there by himself. I, I, Sean and I were talking about an ad break. Sean said, well, why didn't he stay with the other guys behind him? Um, he can ride in the shelter a little bit, ride with some company. Maybe they could pull out. We were talking about just now. Uh, and I was suggesting perhaps a rider like Barter and some other people, and you know yourself when you go out with your, your, uh, on your training rides sometimes, sometimes you just need to ride at your own pace, in your own headspace, and get that sort of that uh, mojo going, you know, sort of get their meditational feeling going so you can just ride by yourself. I don't know, maybe. Maybe he's just a nutter. Who knows? And Certainly. the big question is... Uh you know, how good is he today? If he is exactly. really, really strong, he could stay out there on his own. But again, the chasers are, you know, working well together. And it's all about having enough uh, energy, enough power to hold on. And on a big day like this, as we see Bart as giving it, you know, full stick almost, still 50 kilometers plus to the finish, you could pay for it on the final climb big time. You could indeed. Welcome back, we're in the mountains. Yes, indeed, it's the Italian Alps for the Giro. And this week is where the Giro is decided. Today may show who's capable and who isn't of stake, sticking the pace in the big mountains. Will they be looking at each other? Who will be turning the screw and putting pressure on another rider? At the moment, as typically you would expect, a breakaway went up the road. Took a long time to get away, though. 70k into this 206km stage. And it's all split up now. Jan Barter, the Czech rider, has ridden away. These uh, four men are chasing. Monteguti uh, of AG2R Le Mondial is uh, chasing De Negri, De Marchi. They're all uh, trying to get some sort of purchase on Jan Barter. But behind, uh, three riders uh, remaining have been dropped. Olivier Kaysen, uh, Nelson Oliveria and Nicholas Mace. Uh, two minutes and 23 seconds down on Jan Barter now, and in the middle there's four guys trying to chase to get up or stay with Jan Barter. They've all had, had him in, in their sights about 12, 15, 20 seconds up the road. And there he is, all by himself, just riding alone. With four riders about 15 seconds back. And 22 now we get from Race Radio. Face of Ivan Basso. Doesn't look particularly happy, does he? Well, any of them do, to be honest. I don't think I'd feel particularly happy. Would you? With the final climb of 27 no. kilometres? No. We can see... I think I'd be a bit more worried about what's coming before it. The uh, run down into Chatelon, if somebody tried to uh, have a go. 
And uh, we can see Basso there uh, under his helmet, the cycling cap. Uh, so it tells us that the condition is uh, it's cool there on the climb. Otherwise, you would take that off because uh, when you're climbing, uh, it can get a bit too warm. But uh, it must be quite uh, quite cold. And we did see, you know, four degrees at one time there. Rabutini with a problem and uh, Jan Bart is still uh, on his way 22 seconds I'm quite sure what he's doing here's Rabotini change of bike and uh, being shoved off slightly more is that a standard a, a, a passerby actually a the side of the road giving him a shove well we saw Lucas Ginto giving uh, Alfredo Bologna a shove the other day I think he'd be quite happy for somebody slightly more svelte to give him a go Matteo Rabotini he's looking at the, the other bikes on he the is, car yeah, saying why can't I have one of them Gonna have one with a motor. Exactly. Farnese Vinia sponsored by Vespa. Agnoli. And Maciej Bodnar is the rider at the front, so the Polish rider, a man who supports these conditions particularly well. And you can see all the big name super specialists as far as domestiques coming towards the front now. Bodna, Agnoli, and then uh, Basso. And if you're looking at the uh, line for Lamprey, Alessandro Spezzioletti is the man first in line there. Well done, keep going. I wonder what's going through that man's mind. He's been very attentive so far, and he's been riding himself into to good shape. Uh, Sean had a pretty disastrous early part of the season. Uh, didn't go according to plan, but he's kept his head. He's ridden, ridden himself into pretty good shape, and Scarponi keeps look, throwing him a look, seeing if everything's uh, there, seeing how he's feeling. He rode up to the side of him just now on his left-hand side, looked across to see that look in the eyes, to see exactly how Basso's uh, body language was. The Lamprey man just behind Basso is uh, Alessandro Specialetti, as we were saying. And then behind him is uh, Scarponi. It's a steady pace, Sean. It's not slow. No, it's certainly not slow because we have seen on the rear end of the peloton quite a number of kilometres further down this climb. Uh, riders getting blown out the rear door. Uh, and so... They're climbing at a good rate, but they're not giving us, you know, their 100% at the moment. And uh, that's what uh, their leader, even Basso, likes. Just a good, strong pace and uh, keep working at it. And that way, there's you know, not as many riders think of going in the attack. Because if you slow it down a lot, if the bunch just starts going very slow, well, then they will attack left, right and centre. And even Basso doesn't like that. He just wants this pace, as we can see, they're setting at the moment. And that suits him. And also... It suits it, just about everybody else, I think. Well, it suits everybody else as well. It suits the other big favourites. But uh, it will be interesting now on the descent. Will they just allow Liquor Gas to continue on as they've been making the pace on all this climb of 22k? Will they allow them to do the descent as well? Or will they somebody try and push on? Normally, in the last kilometre, two kilometres, the climb, it starts getting nervous. Everybody wants to be in the top 15, 20 riders to commence the descent. What is going on? Is this the incredibly bad underpants club of northern Italy? Come on, lads, sort it out. We're supposed to be an in incredibly fashion-conscious nation. Gloves going on for the descent, Sean, so it's pretty uh, nippy out there. Not good at all. It's uh, going to suit Joaquim Rodriguez this pace. It's suiting Scarponi. No problem at all with that. Rohanu's team of Androni are up towards the front as well. Lots of concentration. We've seen concentration right the way through uh, the Giro d'Italia, but I sense a little tension in some of these riders. Bodna has really got the, the head on for doing his job here. Agnoli keeps looking behind him, make sure 
that uh, Basso is safe and in his wheel. There's a lot of tension as they come towards the top of this climb of the uh, Col de Juno. Yes, you can see there is uh, a lot of concentration in the uh, in the faces of the riders here, and uh, I suppose it's a big day. Everybody has uh, their role, their job to do here, and uh, you know the riders on the front, Bordenar, and the guys who want to make this pace here uh, for them as well. It's probably difficult, uh, you know, to be uh, to keep on making the pace, so they're just concentrating, really concentrating on what they're doing. And the other big favourites also, concentration is a big thing here, and. Just to uh, you know, get everything right. Keep climbing in the right gear. Also, keep eating a little bit when you get an mm -hmm. occasion here. Keep drinking as well because that's the other thing, I suppose. When the weather conditions change, sometimes uh, when it gets a bit cold, you might not feel like drinking and you might not feel it uh, to eat, and uh, then you can pay for that in the end. So just concentrate. Uh, Real concentration is very important for everything, you know, that you get everything right on a big day. And this is going to be, you know, I think it, it's a very special day because it's the first real big day in the mountains. Everybody is a little bit anxious. Says it all really, doesn't it? Frank Schlech Schlech's uh, grimace at the weather conditions. Meanwhile, Jan Barter continues uh, climbing towards the top of the uh, Col de Joux. Well, eating and drinking is a big thing, Sean. Normally, on a, a long descent that isn't too difficult, you would uh, possibly make sure that you uh, got something out of your back pocket and took a little bite of something on the way down if, if it wasn't going hell for leather. Uh, but it might be a bit different today if the weather conditions are a bit tricky. And that it causes a problem now is when you actually eat. It's, uh, it's quite difficult. Yes, well, that's the other thing. You have to uh, remember that the descent is going to be maybe a little bit more dangerous, a bit more tricky uh, in the wet conditions. So you will have to you know, eat a little bit more on the uphill when you get the opportunity and drink a little bit. Uh, where on the dry conditions, we've seen the riders, you know, they can uh, uh, just drink and eat something very easy on the descent. But if the road is wet, well, then you always have to just be careful in case it's, uh, it, it slows suddenly in front of you on the wet road. It's, it's, it's that's bit more dangerous yes I have the distinct feeling that uh, liquid gas are just going to control the descent coming over the top here and running down the other side too dangerous for their man uh, to go absolutely flat out but they can descend very quickly liquid gas as a team they've got a good group of descenders but I'm not sure it's going to happen for them t t uh, today or for us Jan Barter may sense this. Uh, so the gap is coming down, Sean. He's gradually losing uh, the advantage he had. And even on a climb like this, you can see how well Matthew Bodnar and the other boys from Liquid Gas are doing. They've cut the gap down by about a minute or so. Yes, and um, you know, 9.48 at the moment. Um, depend on what happened on the descent as well. As a Schleck at the back here, Sean. You can see Schleck is... Uh, he's right at the back. Is he right at the back? It looks to me as though he's right at the back. He is. Yes, he is. Maybe been back to the car to uh, get a rain jacket or to drop something up or pick something up, but he's just sitting right at the back. Jose Serpel was just behind him. Well, for the moment, with the liquid gas just making a strong pace on the front of the bunch, uh, he can move up before the descent, but if he hangs around there uh, as we go over the top and start making the descent in that position, it's not a good place for Schleck because, first of all, he's not a good descender. So if you're not, you have to really start out in front and try and you know, follow some of the better riders down because if somebody allows a gap of you know, 20, 30 metres, mm. Frank Schleck is not the man who can you know, come around him. This is Rohanu. Rohan has decided to make a move by himself. He was being paced at the front. Serpa was doing a lot of job, for him, and so was Jackson Rodriguez. Oh, and that looks like Kunigo going after him. Oh, it's not going to be what we thought it might be. Small alarm bells will start ringing in the liquid gas camp. Rohanu is a little bit dangerous. And Lamprey have got two big guns to uh, fire off here. So they can play the one-two against liquid gas Ruhanu goes and it looks like Kunigo is going with him and has reached him he's been in fine shape Damiano Kunigo mustn't panic mustn't panic liquid gas they must just keep the pace going 
Kruniger is a very good descender. Rohanu, not quite so good. And remember, way back in uh, in the Giro d'Italia in the past, when uh, Kruniger was battling a against uh, Yaroslav Popovic at that time, a very promising young rider in the north of Italy. Popovic, his uh, lines through corners was terribly erratic. You know, he had all sorts of different cornering lines, whereas Kruniger was very smooth. It's both as fast as each other, they're both effective, but this is a big attack by Rohanu, Sean. Yes, it is a big attack, and uh, he's not alone Kruniger to get onto his wheel. He's keeping it going, uh, pushing on there, and he knows that... Uh, uh, if uh, Kuniko can get to his wheel, well, then the possibility of uh, being allowed to stay out in front is much, much less. Well, if he can get away on his own, and when you look at the general classification, he's that bit further down, and he might be allowed to take, you know, an advantage uh, uh, sufficient that he can make the descent. But what is the tactic here? You know, uh, is he trying to get away to get across to the breakaway, or is he, is, does he want to get across maybe to make the descent to be in the f to be in the front, get to the top of the climb? two minutes ahead that way he can make the descent with a bit of ease uh, that is also possible that that could be his tactic well, in order to get away from the liquid gas pace he'd have to put in a big attack but uh, I'm not sure that if you commit yourself this far out Sean he looks very aggressive to me that it's going not going to be one one that he wants to take all the way but uh, it's different uh, situation for Lamprey as Jan Barta goes over the top. Now let's see how this descent is going to be like in these conditions. A different uh, situation for Lamprey, Sean. They've got two big favourites and every other team's got to watch out for both of them. Yes, well, I think uh, Kunego, you know, in the general classification, they're not going to allow him at 137 in the general. Uh, I'd be surprised if Lamprey, you know, uh, allowed that to, to ride away. Uh, but again, um, when you look at the uh, final climb of the day, if Lamprey just continue on making the pace and uh, Cunego do ride over the top just behind uh, Lugano, he can come uh, come back to him on the descent, but uh, Liquid Gas might not get too concerned. They just continue on making the pace, make the descent and the final climb, which is you know a huge one, 27 k's, uh, they might just uh, make the calculation, well, these two guys will have our screen now, Lugano and Cunego. Uh, you know, they're not going to arrive with any more than a minute and a half, two minutes uh, to, to the final climb. And in that case, it's going to be difficult to stay out there. Kuniko gets into the wheel of Rohanu. Let's see how this is going to work out for Jan uh, Barta. Now, just watch the line. For those of you watching for the first time, don't watch the body, watch the rear wheel. Watch the way the bike skips around or what sort of line he takes. If you watch the rider's body, if you're watching the, uh, the Giro for the first time, you'll see how he shifts his weight on the bike, that's fine. But just look at that rear wheel and see how the, he corrects the bike at any time. The, the climb was uh, resurfaced here, and the descent was resurfaced about uh, two years ago, two, three years ago. And so all that emulsion that comes out, the oils that come out of the tarmac when it's laid down uh, won't be there anymore. If it had been... Uh, if it had been laid down brand new tarmac this year or before the Giro arrived, that would have been pretty tricky on the descent, to be honest, because it gets quite slippery, amazingly. A road doesn't get very, very grippy just because you lay it down straight away. It gets grippy when the uh, oils and emulsions and stuff within the tarmac rise to the surface and get washed away. And uh, also the rubber from tyres gets laid down on it, which sticks to the tarmac and makes it more grippy. Let's watch this descent. Barter's taking it pretty easy here, Sean. Sure. Yeah, he's not, he's not confident, not happy. No, doesn't look to be happy there, and uh, the line as well, he's not getting as uh, perfect, but uh, I suppose uh, it's, uh, it's a long ways out, and uh, there's no reason to really push it too much here. Still, uh, all this descent to go, which is uh, 18 k's in total of a descent, so just get down it and... Uh, see what he's got on the final climb but it's you know we can see that the bunch is i think up the pace a bit we could see on the hairpins where we could see rugano and cunego just up up ahead and uh, the bunch seems to be uh, you know up in the pace a little bit right is beginning to suffer this looks like jan bakelins and they're all going to be strung out for the rest of today and there's some miserable looking faces back here 
Penyuk goes past us. Alexander Krajinski. And this is Frank Schleck. Well, of course, he has. He did get uh, brought down in a tangle with Alex Rasmussen, which they still haven't uh, worked out who's responsible for. Schleck, he says it's Rasmussen. Rasmussen says you're a big fat liar. You can't, well, a big skinny liar. It's not, yeah, it's not uh, my fault. Uh, and uh, he's saying he's suffering with the shoulder still. But uh, he said he must be suffering an awful lot with the shoulder if he's off the back this far, Sean. Yes. Uh, oh, look at Rohano. Yes, well, Rohano's putting on and, uh, another bit of pressure on Cornego here. And Cornego uh, uh, in a bit of difficulty to match uh, the pace of Rohano. But uh, Schleck, yes, he was sitting a long ways off. And, of course, if there's a little bit of an up in pace and Ryder starts to lose contact in the bunch, it, uh, the gap opens slowly. First of all, it's two bite lengths, then it's five, then it's six. And... You know, you look up ahead and 20, 30 metres ahead, 10, 15 riders ahead of you, there's a big gap of 30 metres, and that is difficult to close on a climb, especially if you're suffering. And if you start very much on the rear, as we see Schleck was doing, well, then uh, it's not the place to be at all. If you're suffering, you have to try and stay somewhere in the top 20, 30 riders. Uh, and if there's, a, if there's a little bit of an acceleration, well, you're not too far off, but it doesn't look like Schleck is happy or not feeling good at all here. Watch, 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 watch. Jan Barter, very unhappy with this corner. No, that's it. That's the end of Jan Barter's. I think Jan Barter will be brought back fairly quickly. If he's descending like that, either the road is absolutely treacherous or he's just not in the least bit happy. I would suspect the latter. Miserable day, and Jan Barter very unhappy on some of these curves. It'll be uh, interesting to see how much gap he has over the chasing riders, Montaguti, De Negri, and so on. Taking it very gingerly indeed. It's this bend we'll notice. Let's have a look. Very wide, comes in across the apex, out the other side. Okay. Okay, yep. He's still very nervous, though. And they don't, the other riders don't seem to be coming down chasing after him, so maybe they're nervous as well. Uh, maybe it is a bit uh, too slippery. Well, Kunigo is dropping back behind Rohano. Let's see exactly what it'll be like when he gets over the top, because he is good at this sort of stuff. Has he lost even more ground to Rohano here? One would suspect so. Jose Rohano is uh, riding very, very well indeed. This is a concerted effort to get right the way to the end, I would think, Sean. Uh, yes, I think he is uh, yeah, really pushing it on here. And uh, depending on what the tactic is here, um, you know, there could be a number of tactics. Is he trying to get away to be on the final climb, maybe for some of the other uh, riders of his team? Or is he just trying to go it alone? And when you look at the general classification at three minutes, uh, you know, he's a danger man, so if he was at nine or ten minutes, well then he would be allowed, you know, much more uh, time of an advantage uh, and back in the bunch they would not get concerned about him, but uh, again, he probably he probably thinks that he can, you know, get up this one and get close to the breakaway, but he still have a long ways to go to get across to the uh, the four riders we had, which was chasing Barta at the last uh, time checks we had. He has indeed 40k to the finish. Remember, it's a massively long climb, and hey, Amador! Whoa. Good lad! Looking like a MotoGP rider. Get that back wheel out there. Look at him! Bonkers. All full of nuttos today. Fantastic. I know a lot of people worry about descents, but you know what? What goes up must come down. It's all part of the great game of cycling. You've got to be good at everything in this game. Jose Rohano. That's exactly what we were talking about earlier, Sean. Here's a, a feed area where the Swaniers are at the side of the road with the musettes. They can hand them over to the team. They can get a little bit of food. It's exactly what we're saying. Normally, at this particular point in the dry, uh, you'd be able to take a little bit of uh, food, maybe a bit of drink. But it doesn't look like that on the descent. It's pretty uh, slippery. And somebody might be able to take some if they're not going too fast. Whoops, in the peloton. Hang on to it, Jose. And uh, then probably we'll just have to eat at the bottom of the final slope of the day. Well, it's it might be a bit late by that time. It's going to be a bit more difficult to eat on the descent, and uh, depending on how the bunch uh, 
go on the descent here. If they go down it uh, pretty easy, well, then you could get a moment where there's a bit of a straight of 150, 200 metres plus. Uh, you can you know, get a drink in that time without any problem. You could also get some food uh, and you know they will be able to do it. But if you're if you're being pushed on the descent and there's some riders at the front of the bunch who want to push on a lot, well, then the opportunity is much, much less to eat or drink anything, anything on the descent. Let's watch Damiano Kunigo now. He is a very good descender. Uh, remember, we've got this overbanding as well and this whacking great big white line through the middle. That doesn't help. And uh, let's see where Rohan. Rohan is only just up the road here. And look, Kunigo has taken out a huge amount of uh, ground out of Rohan already. Over the top come the rest of the peloton. Not much chance. What's the rolled up newspaper doing in the back of the Uskil Terror Riders jacket? For those of you new to it, it's the old trick of stuffing a newspaper down the front of your jersey or uh, to just. <laughs> Rahan has just been eaten alive by Kunigo. <laughs> wow. Um, to uh, block the wind, it keeps you a lot warmer. Very, very good insulator. I want yours there. Indeed. Need to let go of your brakes a bit. It's difficult, though, to have that sort of, I mean, what is this man doing? Good grief. Whee! Down we go. <laughs> uh, you've, uh, you've got to have that confidence. It's difficult to get that confidence. You've either got it or you haven't. Some people never really get it. And uh, sometimes if you've got a big spill, you never regain it. Erratic would be a good word at this point. Spectacular, though. Let's have a look. What are we getting a replay of? Fab. Look, big slide. He's taking a few chances. Here we go again. He's going to come off. He's going to come off. 18k of descent. And uh, let's see how long it is before it's... Uh, Tears before bedtime here. I should be mightily impressed if he gets to the bottom without coming down. Yes, he is pushing Whoa! a little bit uh, too much here, as we can see. Uh, and you know, you have to make the calculation as well. If you're uh, if you're going for the finish at the bottom this climb, okay, you can take risk and you it, it's worth doing it. But uh, with a climb of 27 k to uh, uh, to get up as uh, as we get to the final, it's a bit much the way he is pushing it on here. Katusha take uh, station around their leader, Joaquim Rodriguez. They're in the black rain jacket. There are UCI rules, by the way, that said you should ha be able to see the numbers uh, or you should be able to identify the teams with uh, rain capes on, but fr quite frankly, they just ignore them and nobody really enforces them. It makes it very difficult to see, but, you know, the conditions are so bad, nobody really worries about it. You've got to, got to protect your rider. Kuniger has just left. Jose Rohano for dead. Looks very, very smooth. And we're just going to, let's go back to Andre Amador if we can and see how he's going. This is the front of the main peloton. And uh, already it looks as if, sure, the liquid gas have had to drop back a little bit to, to sit around uh, Ivan Basso, who's off the front of the peloton now. Uh, Amador. Looks like Astana at the head of affairs, unless this is a chasing group, which I don't think it is. Unless, and we haven't seen any indication that uh, Liquid Gas have put the hammer down and gone away. No. I'd be very uh, suspicious. Highly unlikely we yeah, could exactly. see Rodriguez is sitting there and uh, he's just uh, following the rivals just in front of him. If there was uh, a number of the favours gone ahead, he would be pushing on a bit more and his teammates would be certainly pushing on. But Basso has slipped back. Uh, quite a bit in that group. We haven't, I can't see them there on the top 15 riders. Not taking it easy or just not uh, very happy. I suspect taking it easy. Funnily enough, this is more dangerous than what we saw earlier because Amador and the rest of them will be coming across wet patches interspersed with dry patches. And some of these white lines hold the water a bit longer than the tarmac. So he's got to watch himself here, but he's really really taking some huge chances Andre Amador chapeau and you're still upright frankly uh, 
Jan Barta did not like that at all, Sean, did he? And he's already been uh, passed. And Jose Rojano doesn't like it either. I think that may have been the calculation of Damiano Cunego as well, saying, look, I'm not going to use all my energy chasing Jose Rojano because uh, I know I can take him on the descent anyway. Yes, uh, I would say the calculation was definitely made by uh, Damiano Cunego. Just uh, leave Lugano, just push on there and I'll take him on the descent. And uh, it was rapidly, he had him pulled back and just went by him at uh, such a fast rate. And Lugano just, you know, made no effort to get in the wheel, just not confident at all. Uh, at the speed Conego was going down, Lugano just wasn't going to try and do that because he just didn't feel he could do it. Here we go again with Andre Amador. Oh, he is taking chances. And he looks up every time he gets her out of the uh, apex of a bend to see where everybody else is. Oh, man. I can hardly watch. <laughs> he's uh, he's going to get a cover cropper, surely. Well, it's making entertaining viewing. But I'm not sure that... Uh, there's, I'm sure there's a lot of people sitting on their sofas at home with heart in mouth especially Andre Amador fans. Damiano Cunego smoothly descending. And actually, he's probably not descending that much uh, slower than Amador. He just looks slower. Roman uh, Kreusinger's uh, team of Astana here at the front now. Looking after Roman Koisinger, Tiralongo second from the uh, front there. There's Joaquim Rodriguez doing okay. And there's a, a little scattering of liquid gas riders a bit further back. But there'll be all sort of uh, riders slipping off the back here. Monteguti is chasing Amador at the moment. Uh, De Marchi and uh, De Negri are now with uh, Jan Barta. And Andre Amador continues at the front into uh, Saint Vincent. The only thing I know about Saint Vincent has got a journalism prize that they uh, uh, present every year here. They should present a spectacular descending prize. question is who's got the legs on the final climb of the day Sean I think it's all going to be it's going to be interesting to see what the gaps are like between our men who are ahead of the peloton but are we just going to see everybody holding fire until the last two three five kilometers of the climb in the peloton that is the big question uh, who is going to start you know going in a long climb like we've got uh, 27 kilometers the final climb of the day is there somebody going to start uh, storing it up very early, uh, highly unlikely because uh, 27 kilometres, if you start going at the, the earlier slopes of it, uh, uh, you can pay it dearly on the top. And the big fails, I'm not sure they will really have a go. Uh, again, it will be the situation. Basso, uh, he will put his men on the front and uh, he will just start uh, making the tempo again. And uh, we've seen there in this group of chasers, so we can see. Um, Kluzinger, I think, is there. Yeah. Astan, and there's a few of the other favourites, but Basso is not there, and there seems to be a little bit of a split, so Basso seems to have lost a little bit of ground there, but we're not getting really good shots to see how far off he I is, think, the other big favourites. I think he might have been in the blue uh, rain jacket just a little bit back of Rodriguez. This is uh, Paolo Terralongo. Um, saying it's the first really big mountain stage. There's two uh, long climbs, difficult ones, but not, not, too, not too tough. Today will be a bit of a waiting race. We're just talking about that. Because as far as uh, we are concerned at Astana, there, we've got to wait for Basso Scarponi to move. Um, and the ones who want to win the Giro. Roman is... Um, is, is, is doing okay. We're all behind him uh, today, but uh, mostly uh, for tomorrow. Uh, oh, is, yes, is it a good course uh, for you today? 
Yes, it's, uh, it's quite a long way for 50 odd kilometers uh, from the bottom to the uh, finish. So often they two climbs to the finish. So today we hope that in the mountains we'll be able to hold it together. Uh, could the uh, could the overall finish to, uh, could the overall uh, leadership change today? Well, today it's uh, just one of those ones where everybody will stay and watch and uh, everybody will control it. Andre Amador back on the road. He's uh, after that elusive win, Sean. He's been in a breakaway, what, about three times, I think, so far. Still pushing on. Yeah, he's still pushing on. With Montecucci, Montecucci at 17 seconds uh, for the race radio. So he hasn't pulled out a big advantage uh, when you see the way he was you know, throwing the bike into them corners, the risk that he was looking, looking like he was taken, but as you said, you know, some of the riders were going down, the line was better, much more smoother, and they can be going just as fast. Yeah, it's difficult to tell, always difficult to tell, but it makes good uh, viewing, that's for sure. He must ride motorbike when he was younger, because he had that style where you kind of sit. Absolutely, sit off the saddle yes. and yeah, like slide motor it around. like MotoGP. Yeah, except MotoGP, yeah, get a two-wheel slide on, Mick Doohan style. 27 kilometres, or just over 27 kilometres to go. We are coming up to uh, Cervinia. Now the climb today it ramps up a little bit, uh, Sean. It's not uh, super smooth. There are a couple of uh, more difficult ramps in it, but it's a long, long climb. That's the main thing. The last person to win here was Ivan Gotti, riding for Seiko way back in 1997. Here, interestingly. All the other times that we've been to Cervinia here on the Giro Italia, and that's true, twice, it's both been the 14th stage, and it's the 14th stage today. There we are, that's the uh, useless stat for the day. All those of you out there. You wouldn't say Amador was a graceful rider, would you, Sean? Certainly not. And uh, we can see there uh, behind uh, Montegutti we had, but now he's being joined by the two others. Uh, Di Negri and uh, the other one is Di Marchi. Uh, so uh, three chasers here, and uh, it will be interesting to see now where uh, where was our leader Barte? Uh, we haven't seen he's him. He's just behind them there. Is, is he yep. between? He's between. No, he's just with those guys that are chasing oh, he's just there. Behind. Was, okay, yeah, so yeah. they have pulled him back also. Yep. Uh, so we have three chasers, and uh, it's been interesting to see now how much uh, t how much uh, time they have on the uh, the other chasers, uh, Cunego and uh, and the rest of the peloton. I'd love to know how Domenico Pozzivivo managed going down there. We haven't seen anything of him at all, but uh, my guess is that the the boys from Astana were controlling the pace, making sure it's all okay. It's a bit of a dangerous game with Pozzivivo around. Gruppetto and Mark uh, Cavendish have just gone through the uh, top of the climb and they will be now on the descent. Now, this is an interesting talking point, Sean, because uh, you all know uh, a lot of sprinters are excellent descenders because they have to be. First of all, they've got uh, very little fear. Secondly, they're brilliant bike handlers. Thirdly, they're always off the back. So if they're going to make some sort of ground up and make some time up to keep within the time limit, they really have to descend quick. Yes, and uh, 2050 is the time they're behind the leader. So uh, on the bunch, not that far off because uh, the bunch was at seven, eight minutes about that uh, on the first man over the top who was Barta. So around the 12 minutes, maybe 11 minutes for the group of... Uh, Cavendish and uh, as you said it will make a good descent so um, I don't think there's going to be a problem for the um, time limit there but again the final climb such a long one if you're really suffering you have to be able to stay in the bus mm. because yeah, this yeah. group you know they go along at a nice pace it's not that they're going dead dead slow you have to be able to sit in there and hang in and if you're on a bad day or a difficult day and you lose contact that's where it gets real dangerous Kreuziger's Astana team are leading them down at the moment. There's uh, Scarponi just sitting behind in the pink and the blue. He's the first man in line there, I would guess. Where is Ivan Basso here? We haven't seen any shots of him. It's a bit difficult for the motorcycle to, to pick up on him. 
and uh, Andre Amador begins the ascent of the final climb of the day to Cervinia 2001 meters in height and it's it's been miserable weather at the front. Just look how smooth Kurnigo is compared to Amador. This is the same bend we saw Amador going around on like a six penny bit. Threat me bit, should I say. Six pennies were perfectly round. Well, Kurnigo is about the size of a six penny and goes round in the same smoothness. Look at the difference though. And I bet he's not descending any uh, slower, Sean. Not really. Yes, uh, that's probably the case. He's probably just going down just as fast as Amador was doing, but the way he was, you know, throwing the bike around, it looked very spectacular. Made some great shots. It did make some great shots. I'm just pleased he stayed upright. One, two, three, four, five, six riders from Astana, and they are pushing on now here, Sean, which would say, uh, seem to me that a number of riders are in trouble. Scarponi is there. Rodriguez is there. We can see uh, Rodriguez in the pink shorts, black uh, rain jacket. Scarponi, look, Scarponi of Lamprey is there. Catherine is also there. Is that so? Not quite sure. There's the intermediate sprint. Uh, not that it matters. Andre Amador, Matteo Monteguti, and Paolo Di Negri. Did they gain? Uh, Seconds, is it? but there's no points available. Uh, no seconds bonus available here. Points are available, but no seconds are available on this stage. It is the first stage in the Giro d'Italia where there are no uh, bonus seconds available. Jan Barta, Matteo Monteguti, Di Marchi, and Di Negri there. Whoop! Pop! Onto the cobblestones goes uh, Damiano Cunego. Riding well. He's been in very good form, uh, Sean. He was in great form in the Giro del Trentino. Didn't quite uh, pull it off in uh, Liège, Bastogne Liège, but he really went for the win in uh, Giro del Trentino, which he'd won twice before. He really, really wanted to take it in the end, but he came up against an, uh, an on-form, or an awesomely on-form, Domenico Podzavivo. I think it took a little bit out of his legs for Liège, Bastogne Liège, but uh, it does show that he's been in good form. I mean, how easy is it to carry that form from something like Liège to here? Well, it's not easy when you're in good shape uh, in the time of Liege, Bastogne, Liege, which is a number of weeks ago. Uh, sometimes uh, the final week of a three-week tour, as we're getting into in this uh, Giro, uh, you can pay the price. And it will be interesting to see how well Cunego will manage here. And uh, in the next number of days in the big mountains, will he be able to stay pretty close to the big favourites? And we know that... Uh, he can lose a little bit of time, but he's also capable of losing a huge amount of time on a day. He can have a real bad one and lose eight, ten minutes, and uh, that is the uh, the concern I would have for Cunego, especially when he's been going. Uh, you know, the time of the Ardennes Classics is quite a time ago. 25 kilometres to go. Beautiful sunshine at the bottom here for Andre Amador. The question is, uh, how far behind are the chasing men? And actually, Cornigo didn't have too much of a gap over the peloton, Sean, when you saw them come round into that cobbled section. And uh, I think Corsica's Astana team deciding that Cornigo, a little bit too much of a threat, will shut that one down. And they're going pretty quick here. Cornigo, the threat. And that's why they have increased the pace on the lower sections of the descent, where they felt it was getting a little bit more grip. Still. We don't know how Ivan Basso was faring, and we don't, certainly don't know how Domenico Pozzavivo was faring. We could see Kruziget, we could see Scarponi, and we could see Gadre and Rodriguez up towards the front, but still some big names missing from that little descent that we could see. He's had a terrifically successful Giro d'Italia so far in terms of aggression, Sean, being out there, but he hasn't pulled off a stage win yet. No, hasn't pulled it off, but uh, certainly uh, very aggressive in the race. And, uh, you know, being up there on the breakaways, uh, aggressive uh, on the descents as well, as we see there on the earlier part when it looked like it was very, very uh, slippery and uh, the wet road. I was really concerned that he was going to, you know, start sliding out, but got down it well and a spectacular descent. Now uh, he's going to have to walk real hard because we can see here the... Uh, this, this chasing group, I don't think they are finished yet, and Amador might have difficulty holding them off. 
Tell me how to could have go to me, Sean. Didn't look completely committed there. He's looking around to where he is in, in the town, having a bit of a look around. I think he knows he hasn't made up enough ground. Well, he would probably made aware by yep. his team director. Uh, He's just waiting for the peloton to arrive, I think. Yes, uh, he knows that he has, you know, a very slim advantage. And uh, the, the, the gap out, out to the breakaway, of course, is very big all the time. So he's going to be in more, no man's land for a long time. And if you would tackle this climb in that situation and start giving us, you know, a lot, uh, close to 100%, that's 27 kilometre climb when you get pulled back by the group, which he will in a number of kilometres if he did continue. So best thing to back off and wait and just uh, join in and get in with the group of leaders. the pink jersey group as we can see and uh, who has made it and who hasn't made it is the big question and now the corner will continue and 12 for the peloton on the leaders on the leader Andre Amador, the leader on the road on the left-hand side. And then uh, De Marchi, just uh, peeling off from the four here on the right-hand screen. Montaguti in the brown shorts of AG2R Le Mondial at the front. Then uh, Paolo Di Negri in the fluorescent yellow of Farnese Vini. Then Jan Barta, who led most of the way up of the... Well, all the way up of the first climb. And then went down with the brakes permanently on as Andre Amador came absolutely flying past him. A lack of commitment. Looks a bit of a bruiser, doesn't it, Sean? <laughs> he's got that, that look like he's in you know, a bulldog chewing a wasp look. Talking of which, did you hear the? Um, did you hear what happened in the Tour of California with uh, Jens Vogt? A bee landed on his lip while he was doing the time trial and stang, stung him, so he ate it. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Could do that. <laughs> Damiano Kunigo at 1.37, not being given any chance to get away as uh, Roman Kroesinger's Astana team want to shut that one down. Went up after Jose Rohan, who saw the opportunity to go, Sean. It was a, a reasonable move to to give it a go. Nice to see, look, see very low section rims. I wouldn't be at all surprised, actually, if they weren't aluminium rims as well on that bike. I can't see them close up. But sometimes, in the wet weather, they're a little bit more predictable. They might not be, of course. They may be very, the low, very, very low-profile carbon ones, which are coming into fashion now. I'm not sure the weather's going to make its mind up what it wants to do until we get uh, halfway up this climb. Dan Bakalin's hanging into the back here. And still, we've yet to see Ivan Basso. We've yet to see Domenico Podzivivo. That looks like Podzivivo on the right-hand side of your shot there. Not too sure. Could be... There's two or three short right There he is, Podzivivo. Hanging in there, Sean, then. So uh, he managed to make the descent OK. Yes, he's made it in this uh, main bunch here. And uh, a good job, because in the earlier part there, it looked pretty, it looked pretty uh, treacherous and you know, it was a very wet road. So he's done, he's done well to hang in there and stay with the main favourites. Montaguti Di Marchi, Di Negri and Barta are the riders on the chase after Andre Amador. And with 23 kilometres to go, it's all uphill now to the finish at uh, Trevinia. Surprised that the uh, Liquid Gas boys allowed Kreusinger and the Astana team to set the pace at the front there. They're very good descenders, Liquid Gas. Maybe Basso was feeling a little bit under pressure, didn't like 
that descent and they were, he wanted his men around him in case he lost any time and had to chase back on or maybe they thought well I tell you what just let them get on with it maybe it shows Kreisinger was a bit more nervous and, need, and needed to shut down that gap well the problem is with uh, with your leader if he's nervous on the descent and somebody else takes it up uh, you've just got to follow on the wheels but uh, if you, if he cannot follow well then you have to drop off and uh, as a domestic you just have to you know stay back with your uh, leader and it's a really difficult one on the descent it's majorly difficult if you're a pretty good descender and your leader has difficulty following the wheel and you feel quite comfortable uh, uh, you know it's it's an experience that they will have with Paso and maybe like that was the reason somebody wanted to push on so they all just drop back slowly instead around Basso and wait until they get down because then immediately uh, when you get to this point or a little bit earlier you can you know, ride and get back into the tail of the bunch very quickly again if you have a number of teammates to do that uh, on the left hand side of your shot is 40 seconds now ahead of Jose Rujano he went away from the front of the peloton but uh, wasn't much cop descending not quite sure what Damiano Cunigo is uh, plugging on for maybe he feels as though he can gain some time I very much doubt it because riding by himself against the peloton he's got seven and a half minutes to gain on Amador so it's not a case of stage win but uh, I don't think the gamble has quite paid off, Sean, at the moment. I'm not really sure the team will know what to do with him here as it goes up for the next 22 kilometres. Well, I think at the moment we can see he's just climbing here and he's not giving it anything near 100%. And he's going to continue on at this because uh, he has about uh, two minutes of an advantage. It looked like when we got to the very bottom of the, of the descent in Châtillon, uh, I was... Uh, Calculating it was much less, and the bunch was much closer to him. But you know, still a nice advantage in two minutes there, and he's just going to keep on working at it. And if there's a lot of attacks, maybe in the earlier path, well, he's ahead of that, and that always helps because uh, you know, if you have to make these sudden bursts in the earlier kilometres of the climb, he's going to make another few kilometres here before he's pulled back. And if he can make it at a slow rate, and I think that's what he's doing at the moment, he's just climbing there giving it not 85 90 percent but not you know digging deep for the moment to play in the waiting game Andre Amador has uh, eight minutes now well, nearly nine minutes actually over the big jersey group there's one minute and five seconds over the chasing group and most of the work's being done by Montaguti. Here is Ivan Basso for the first time with their best young rider Damiano uh, Russo behind him. And so far, Sean, we've been very lacking in ability to see exactly where all those big favourites are on the road against each other. We know that Kurisinger, uh, Gadre, Rodriguez, uh, and Scarponi were all together. This man, of course, is further up the road, but we really don't know where Basso is. Uh, no, I don't know what Basso is, but I reckon he's in that group. Um, uh, we haven't been seeing any uh, shots of a, a group out the rear there. It looked like that was the uh, peloton where we see Basso and uh, a shot just a moment ago. So I reckon he's in, in the main group there and uh, all the big favourites, except for Schleck. Frank Schleck, we haven't seen him and he was a long ways off on the climb to see, you know, make his way back through it uh, and uh, get into the main part of the front, more front end of the bunch with the big favourites, so he's still out the rear. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. And as we Your get intelligent put, guess on that? I doubt if, if Schleck made it back in. The way he was looking, it didn't look good, but again, uh, you know, it was still quite a number of kilometres for the top and we know Schleck's climbing ability he can get into his rhythm there and just uh, go through groups of riders pass riders and make it into the front Twenty one and a half kilometres of climbing still to go it's a good day for Amador uh, and breakaways to try and stay there Sean because in this very first day of the, the proper high mountains First of all, you've got to be able to ride in the high mountains. And uh, secondly, the big favourites are still all marking each other. So if you think you've got the legs, it's not a bad day to have a go. No, it's not a bad day at all. And uh, when you look at the uh, advantage for the uh, breakaway and uh, 
Amador here, like it's nine minutes of an advantage. Uh, the concern will be the four chasers now, how far they are off. We could see him there having a look down uh, to the right to see where they are. Uh, I think they're not that uh, that far off, so if there's somebody strong in that four-man chasing group, they could start coming across to Amador. The gap is coming down between the four on the right-hand side. Uh, a lot of work being done by Matteo Monteguti at the moment and Andre Amador is at the head of the race and as you said Sean it's clearly not over yet for that chasing group no certainly not one minute advantage uh, you know, with the four chasers uh, uh, still with 20 kilometers to go um, it's uh, not a lot of minute and Amador he's you know out there on his own if the if the four chasers can ride a bit together and just you know share the space pressing on the front well then we could see them just pulling it you know eating into that venture but again it's all about how fresh they are and uh, you know what they have got left uh, how much energy they have got if uh, if the four chasers are you know all suffering a lot well then amador could be the strongest one he could just hang on to this advantage for a long long time and then making the calculation back to the bunch to almost nine minutes it's a good advantage and unless there's a lot of attacks in the earlier part of this climb he could go you know very close to the finish maybe go all the way he could well do and so could these four as well if they come up to him that's the virtual overall standings if it's if the race were to finish exactly where it is now Damiano Kunigo would move up to third spot overall just 25 seconds down and he would certainly sign for that if he could sign Absolutely. right away exactly <laughs> Monteguti's doing a good job here would you Adam and Eve Matthew Monteguti in a break has a chance of catching Andre Amador uh, with these four here and, and even possibly contesting for a victory and having said for all of this year in Italia so far that age and the rest of the year age 2 r were winless they took two yesterday Sebastian Eno taking Circuit de la Reine and uh, Sylvain Georges taking the stage in the Tour of California. Two in one day. They might even get a third in today, Sean. That would be a turn up for the books. Well, as we often say, when a team, uh, they get a win on the belt, so they seem to you know, get uh, uh, other ones that put that bit more easy and uh, everybody's relaxed and uh, amazing, like AG2R, they're waiting such a long time as we can see the main bunch here that is Schleck Schleck. Yeah, Schleck has made it back into this main bunch he's sitting right behind Roman Kreisiger Sean there that's good riding by Frank but uh, clearly then the I think the pace at the top of the climb by the uh, peloton was closely closely controlled first of all by Katusha and then by Astana just making sure that everybody was safe and I think that's worked quite well for uh, for Frank Schleck. This young rider, Caruso, wearing 12 there. Scarponi with number one. Turn that characteristically big gear. Schleck is in there. Basso is in there. So all the big favourites. Most of the big favourites. We saw Domenico Podzavivo was in the back of that uh, group earlier on, so he may well. Uh, He'll be there a little bit uh, later as well towards the front. Uh, here's what uh, Jean Gadre thought of his chances today. Uh, it's not uh, good to start early, but uh, I'll have to show something. I've got um, two minutes and 30 seconds down uh, today, so if I can take about a minute 30, I'll, I'll definitely try. kilometers to go for our lead man Andre Amador it looks like uh, Der Marquis is now trying to eat up that gap between himself and Amador that's a little bit more of a concerted push to see if, who can stay with him because he keeps looking over his shoulder getting up out of the saddle feels he's got some energy left to still push on here Sean uh, yes, and uh, it tells me that the four chasers, they're not pulling well together because uh, still with 20 kilometres to go as they just pass through it at the moment. Uh, 
uh, if it was working well together I think everybody would be happy just to keep on plugging away at it because 20 kilometres of a climb it's a long way and uh, when you see somebody going in the attack well then it just says that there's maybe one of the guys or possibly two of them just want to, want to cling on the rear and get carried along Amador, we've seen him in three breakaways already Frank Schleck. Just uh, looking as if he was uh, quite comfortable sitting in there, spinning a very, very low gear indeed. Well, I understand we had a bit of a technical problem with uh, Jean Gadry, and you probably couldn't hear him. We could, but uh, let's see what he has to say about uh, today. We'll start from the top, I think. It's sure that we don't have to start from but... Not uh, so we're good to start uh, early. We'll have to try something. He says, uh, two minutes 30 down. I need to get about one minute 30. Or I won't hesitate to do something if I can. I hope my legs will be there. We'll know at the end of the stage. Uh, you've learnt this final climb to Chevinia. What are you thinking about? Uh, there's a lot of kilometers, but it's not actually that difficult. And there are some uh, flatter ramps, and sometimes the, uh, it'll depend on how the average speed is. If the uh, riders go fast, then, you know, we'll all have to go fast. But I think uh, it's the beginning of uh, the climb. There'll be a few riders still ahead. Oh, how right he was, Sean. There are a few riders ahead. Andre Amador is the man out ahead at the moment and uh, it looks like uh, Di Marchi has managed to make the break oh hello look at this Marzio Brusigin and Ceruca have come across to uh, Damiano Cunego here and that's an interesting little group uh, Marzio Brusigin who's finished on the podium in the Giro d'Italia before very strong rider yeah, on his day Sean is the sort of rider who can really eat up the kilometers on this sort of climb Yes, uh, on this sort of claim, uh, Brusikin is very strong, but uh, again, is he in the good enough shape? Uh, we haven't really seen and we haven't had the occasion to see him or a lot of other riders in that case uh, in the general classification. We haven't had a real test and uh, Chiruka, they're also pushing on. And of course, uh, Bruchigan is going to sit here because uh, with his teammate out in front, mm -hmm. uh, he's not going to ride here. and. The advantage for the uh, lone man out in front is still a good advantage and uh, with 18 kilometres to go, it will be interesting if he can keep working as he is and uh, is he going to hold up the four chases we had on the road? That is the other question because they were getting a bit aggressive and starting to attack each other. So I feel we could see one of them four chasers uh, coming across and to join up with our leader on the road, Amador. I think actually, Sean, that's probably what's happened with the team Car, the director sport teams have made the decision as the speed is definitely going up a little bit here in the peloton with uh, uh, liquid gas on the front dictating pace uh, Brugigin has decided or the team has decided that Brugigin has a chance at 2 minutes and 47 seconds and he's a very strong guy to get up to Cunado because Amador may well have the gap cut down and in the end he's been doing so much riding by himself he may miss out on the chance of a stage win so launch another man into this into the uh, volley well i think uh, it's going to be difficult uh, for uh, that group of kunego Chiruka and bruce again because the uh, the big bunch of favorites is not that far off and we can see just our last shots of the front of the bunch uh, Liko gets starting to push on here. We can see now at the moment it's uh, you know starting to up in pace and it's going to be difficult for the three, uh, the Bruschkin group, to pull away here. So I don't think they will uh, get enough of an advantage to stay all the way to the finish uh, to have any chance of pulling back time and moving up in the general classification for Bruschkin. Right, is at the front then. Favourites at the front. We know uh, Ivan Basso is there. The pink jersey of Joaquin Rodriguez is in there. Next to Rodriguez on the left-hand side, riding in the Garmin kit. Garmin Barracuda kit is Ryder Heisdahl, former pink jersey wearer at that. You can see with the Cervelo mark on the back of the jersey, just bobbing and weaving a little bit, number 95 there. Uh, Roman Koisinger, just uh, back a little bit off the front. 
there or just sitting behind Ryder Heisdahl, keeping himself out of trouble. So a lot of the favourites up in that leading group there. And there we are, there's not much of a chance of them getting away, as you said, Sean. Ahmed Cheruka and uh, Marcio Brusigan with Damiano Kuniga. And they're going to shut down one of the danger men, or two of the danger men. I mean, Brusigan is a bit less dangerous, but Kuniga has got a very small gap, 1 minute 37 seconds. And they're going to shut this one down. Yes, uh, well, they're not going to allow them to take a... Uh any sort of a big advantage here and uh, we can see the pace being set by liquid gas and uh, it's always difficult because Chiruka is the only one who's riding at the moment and uh, how long will the liquid gas riders last here and uh, if they do slow down a bit I think there'll be more attacks out of the bunch there's a lot of riders here uh, in the general classification I think almost everybody is up there and that top 15 rider seems to be there I see uh, Cataldo is also there so that tells like that I think uh, the top 15 riders at least in the general classification starting out this morning they all seem to be there for the moment yeah and Barta it's been an interesting day so far Everybody's just watching, watching, watching. No real salvos have been uh, fired, Sean. Uh, some of our chasing men, Olivier Kaysen. And they're not going a huge amount of uh, speed, Sean, because uh, Kaysen's just sitting there laughing and joking a little bit with Nelson Oliveria. So it's not been, uh, for those guys up ahead, it's still not going great guns here. No, and uh, I think for that group, of, here as well. that group of case, and uh, they probably have to be pulled back by that uh, yes, Chiruka, sure, yeah. and um, Kaysen seems to be quite happy, and uh, he would be, because he's done a good job today. He's been out in front, and you know uh, the day is over for him. He's just to get up this climb now, and uh, he's just going to you know, climb it at an easier pace and get inside, get, get inside the time limit, which is no problem, and uh, finish the day. Uh, so he looked quite happy uh, but back in the bunch, we can see that for the moment, Liquid Gas are setting a good pace, but uh, certainly not pushing it on majorly because everybody seems to be comfortable for the moment. There's a bit of suffering going on now. Yep. Jan Barta is giving it everything here to try and get up to Alessandro De Marchi of Androni. There's uh, De Marchi. Chiruk is riding on by himself. Kunigo knows that uh, the uh, peloton's going to come up to them fairly shortly. But Chiruka, well, trying to get a bit of exposure, trying to uh, get away a little bit. He's not had the greatest of uh, Giro d'Italia, Sean, but they're so far behind the leading men at the moment, it's difficult to see any chance of him going for stage victory here. Well, it looks impossible that he's going to ch catch the leader on the road, uh, Amador, because it's still around the seven minutes, I reckon, yes, for this so. uh, this man here. Or just at the front end of the bunch, it's around that seven-minute mark. So, uh, highly unlikely he's going to close down on Amador. And uh, Amador seems to be riding uh, quite strong at the moment. And, you know, he's walking away at it here. We can see, you know, this section, it eases off a bit, it flattens out a bit, and he's strong on that section. The three bus sections, that's where he will suffer a bit, but... He is a big, powerful guy, and with 15 k's to go, uh, he's you know doing a great job for the moment, uh, riding very strong all the time. Liquid gas again, exerting control. Is it a bit of a damp squib, Sean? Today? Yes, I think uh, it could be that, and. Uh, it's often the case where you get a real difficult stage and, and you're expecting a lot on the final climb and so for some reason just the big favourites they start to uh, tactically they just you know mark themselves out and uh, and the situation as well with the breakaway quite a long ways ahead with our lone man on the road you know seven eight minutes plus uh, starting into the final climb a lot of the riders here would be would be thinking of maybe going for a stage who are a long ways down the general classification but 
uh, very good in this sort of mountain top finish uh, they would say to themselves well it's not going to happen today to pull the leaders back they are going to you know probably hold out there and they don't get aggressive aggressive in the earlier part of the climb and then you have a situation where a team like Liquid gets that making the pace and they will continue for a long time and we could get to the last two or three kilometres uh, to see some attacks if that and they're not going to a lot happen if you leave it to the last two or three kilometres. Michigan on the left hand side of your screen pushing on Quite sure what the tactic is from Marcio uh, Brugelschigit. He's from the region around Venice. Thirty seconds between Amador and uh, Di Marchi, and Jan Barter is just uh, there. Uh, Damiano Cunego comes back into the main group, slips in behind the line of uh, Michele Scarponi and Liquid Gas are. Well, they're pushing on the the speed here. It's beginning to get a bit strung out. No problems, I can see, in the middle of that group. Uh, turning a big gear once again for such a small man. Domenico Pozzavivo taking the opportunity to take some uh, liquid on board. And all the big favourites are in this group. But it's beginning to be stretched out into one single pace line here, Sean. Yes, uh, it seems to be stretching a little bit and... Uh Liquid Gas probably opened the pace a little bit by slowly and just stretching the bunch out and uh, it will be interesting to see how long or how fast they will set the pace and uh, they still have uh, what uh, three riders here, four riders from Liquid Gas, five riders from Liquid Gas still here on the front so uh, you know they still have a lot of manpower left here and will they really put on the pressure or will they just continue on making this pace get through this day, get it over with and uh, leave it for another day and uh, that could be the tactic of Lico Gas Basso, maybe he just wants to get through the fourth day, get that over with and then see uh, in the days to come and there's a lot more of opportunity so it depending on how they're feeling and I suppose how uh, all the Lico Gas riders are feeling and how Basso feels today and they will just you know, calculate then what to do in this final uh, 15 kilometres for the peloton It's the Costa Rican uh Leader on the road here, Andre Amador, riding for Movi Skies. Even for, uh, for them for the last couple of years with the case to pan before that. Demarque is still trying to close the gap to him and uh, having and struggling a little bit, I think, as is the man chasing Demarque, Jan Barta. There we are. He's really burying himself, Jan, Jan Barta. And he has been all day. Have, isn't he just indeed? On the first climb of the day, we see him in the uh, beginning, uh, the Col de Jou. Uh, immediately, he goes in the attack out of the breakaway, and he just seemed to be the limit on the, all on the climb, on all the climb. And then on the descent, he was more on the limit. Yeah, even more so, yeah. Not quite as on the limit as Andre Amador was. He leads at the moment. Andre Amador, the Costa Rican. Got a Costa Rican father, I believe. There's in, in the centre. Dominico Pozzaviva, 151, and that sky blue Colnago kit. Small team, Colnago, Sean. They must be very pleased with the way things are going at the moment with uh, Pozzaviva uh, because their budget's about only about 2 million euros, which doesn't which sounds like a lot, but it really isn't much at all. Yes, and they will be that bit happier at this moment because uh, this morning setting out, the mm. weather not looking good, and... Uh, this descent uh, off the first climb of Col de Jou, they would be concerned about it and uh, for Paul de Vivre, as we talked about many times, do not like the wet conditions, the wet descents and here he is now uh, inside the final 15 kilometres almost and he's in with all the big favourites so to get this day over with, which could have been a real difficult one for them and for the Colnago team, uh, they're faring out quite well because Paul de Vivre is not going to have any uh, difficulties from here on uh, the question is now will he try and attack in the final I think he might I also think that Rohano may have another go as well he's clearly got the uh, leg shown because he dropped Damiano Cunigo but of course he was taken back on the descent because he too is uh, how should we say not the most talented of descenders and was taken back very very quickly indeed having pulled out a gap Boba Kunigo, and I have just a sneaky suspicion that he's that sort of aggressive rider, he will give it a go. 
7 minutes and 16 seconds is the gap between Andre Amador and the pink jersey group. Not to worry about Amador for the overall classification. He's way down. He's not going to trouble them in the slightest. Amador at 23 minutes and 13 seconds. And there he is. He's got a brother, by the way. Ivan. Uh, never really never really made it. He was an, another elite rider, but uh, never really got a professional contest. I think he's retired now. And we can see the, the gap back to the Marquis. Uh, it's coming down a bit. It's coming down 13 seconds, I see, just a moment ago. So uh, the Marquis looked like he was struggling, but he seems to be climbing on a, uh, a very heavy gear, a high gear, and looks like that he is uh, in difficulty. But again, you know, it's uh, very difficult to make the calculations. The time is telling, and it looks like uh, 31 seconds we did here some time ago, now down to 13, and we can see there on the shot he's definitely closing down on Amador. And the Krigas are still upping the pace, I feel. And who are they going to put on the rivet first? This is the question, because it's a long, long climb, and if they've got strength in numbers, if they feel they've got enough overall strength to use up their domestiques one by one, who are they going to put on the rivet? Number 155, Nicholas Mass. <laughs> Last man in the bunch. Oh. <laughs> I think it'll be a fairly safe bet, that one. Amador still plugging away. Yes, young, younger, uh, what other brother, should we say, Ivan. Only really rode up to uh, top amateur level. This is purpose, Sean. They are definitely purposeful here as Valerio Agnoli, a good man for the fast climb, gets onto the front. And as you said, Nicholas Mace having a bit of trouble there at the back. Let's be sensible, though. Which the big guys they get upon the under pressure? Frank? Um, well, Frank uh, surprised me that uh, he was so far off on the climb, and uh, we did see there was a little bit of uh, opening pace, and uh, it looked like that he was in a group behind, and after getting caught out, and after the descent, we see he's back in the bunch here, so I think he's climbing well because he did move up a lot on the climb itself, and that tells me the, uh, the form was not too well with Frank. An impossible question. I don't know who's going to get in difficulty because uh, liquid gas are definitely up in the pace here. We can see the way the bunch is stretching out. And look at uh, the time gap coming down. Yes, and tumbling. Who, yes, well, I'm, I'm not surprised that the time gap is coming down because Amador has been out for a long time. The breakaway, they're all starting to struggle because there's just, you know, it's almost a one man battle. Uh, they're all scattered all over the mountain here, and uh, the bunch is going to eat into their time. 6.30 with 12 to go. Is it going to be enough for the uh, for the leaders out on the road, for Amador and for Demarki? Because if somebody goes in the attack and the bunch will finish so fast here, uh, it's um, it's not going to be uh, easy for the uh, leaders to hold off the uh, the strong men of the of the bunch. No, nope, not at all. This uh, gap continues to come down with 11, no, basically 12 kilometres to go. Some real intent by Liquid Gas to keep the pace so high that attacks out of it are very difficult and put their rivals under real pressure. Still with four men. And Yoli is the sort of uh, man who could do this for a long time. He's very, very good at it. Demarki, strong rider, coming up to, uh, to Amador. Ooh, that's a face and a half. We've got two very determined men here, uh, Sean, André Amador and uh, Alessandro De Marchi. 6.45, and they will also be made aware by their team cars that the peloton has begun to accelerate. Yes, uh, well, they will uh, certainly be made aware, and uh, of course, you know, on a final climb with a finish on the top, it's always going to happen that the, you know, there's a, po a big possibility there will be some uh, action back in the bunch, as Did you can you see. see. the look? <laughs> yes, and uh, uh, I think uh, DeMarchi maybe not happy with Amador because Absolutely. attacking so early in the climb, uh, you know, they had a nice group there together, and if they had walked a bit more, uh, it would have made it a bit more secure to get to the finish, as we can see 640, that is the question now, how fast is the bunch going to go, is liquid gas going to continue? 
all the way in this final 10, 11 kilometres. Are they capable of doing it? How strong are they? The uh, three, four men from Liquid Gas on the front. Mm. Is there somebody else going to go in the attack? And if we have attacks uh, pretty shortly uh, and the pace you know, goes up a lot, well, then that six minutes will come down so quickly and uh, our two leaders are going to have to pull well together to try and you know, keep the advantage as much as possible because we're getting to a section in the end where it does kick up a lot and the steeper sections, I think, that's where our two leaders uh, will start struggling majorly. And Yoli has done his job, Hill, so the best young rider starts to take up the front, the real proper climbing super domestique. Sylvester Schmidt is the last man uh, to sit in front of Ivan Basso. It's still not hugely fast, I and mean, it's fast enough, but we haven't seen big gaps appearing at the moment. Some riders, Fletcher, hanging on in there. This is Jan Barta trying to get up to DiMarchi and Amador. That look, that look DiMarchi gave, I think you're absolutely spot on, Sean. I think he's very unhappy with him that he attacked so early and didn't keep working and keep the breakaway going away. And even more unhappy that as soon as he got to him, he said, come on, come through and do some work. Yes, and... Um, sort of, I've been chasing you for the last God knows how long. Yes, well, I think uh, when you look at the situation... Here we are, but watch this, watch it. Um, <laughs> Yes, it says it all. Exactly. What you're playing at? Sorry, you were saying, Sean, we just had to stop and watch that for a minute. Yes, and it was, you know, um, a real good situation uh, that they were in the breakaway to continue on walking at it for a bit longer. When you have a climb of 27 kilometres, uh, you know, to go in the attack uh, so early, uh, it's always a huge risk. And, uh, you know, is the bunch going to really accelerate? First of all, you know, will they start riding on the descent and then at the beginning of the climb? And if they do that, eight, nine minutes in advantage on a 27-kilometre climb, it's always, you know... Uh, a little bit risky that you can hold on and I think that's why DeMarchi was looking at Amador and saying well what the hell are you doing and why yeah, exactly. did you go on the attack early uh, if we you know if we just walk together and the strongest ones will always find themselves in the front when you get on a climb like this with four or five in a breakaway uh, you know the two or three stronger ones will naturally ride away on the climb and uh, then you just keep on working keep on sharing and you will keep the advantage much more uh, by doing that and here we are now they're starting to struggle because they had a big battle. Amador just fighting to hold on out in front. Demarki just fighting big time to try and get back up to him. And they're all going to pay for that effort in the final 10 kilometres. Our two leaders on the road go under the 10 kilometre to go banner. Andre Amador from Movistar at the back and Alessandro Demarki from Androni, who's reached him, cast him the evil eye and said, why on earth did you attack so early? We could have kept going. This is one of the steepest ramps on the climb, about 12%. Jan Barta, who has about 28 seconds or so to make up on them. Maybe a little bit less now. Indeed, 25 seconds. So he's gradually coming back at them, but he's been working at it all day. If it had to be down to sheer effort today, then this man would uh, deserve the stage victory. But he went down the descent of the Col de Joux like he'd been on a bike for about a week and a half and he was easily overhauled by Amador who went down like Mick Doohan and then they and then attacked the other side but it's still not going super quick here at the front you can see some of the riders who are hanging in here we saw Stefano Pirazzi was in the front here uh, and a number of other riders who are just not super climbers Cataldo we were talking about earlier still in this group and so they're not being put absolutely on the rivet yet and still a fair way out. Uh, Sean, another two, three kilometres maybe, maybe even more. Uh, three and a half, possibly four kilometres and they will start to give it a dig if that's their intention. Well, I'm sure there's somebody here in the bunch will try. When it gets a little bit more uh, steep or gradient, at the moment we can see, uh, you know, it's, r it's flattened out, relatively flat here. And uh, uh, when you have a, a team rider in the front, they will keep the pace really high. And uh, the opportunity to go on the attack here for the climbers is not the place to do. They'll, they will wait and uh, still with 9.6 kilometres to go, there's... Uh, sufficient amount of time and uh, with the uh, with the steep gradients uh, kicking up further on the 
possibly will go in the attack. It all depends on how well Liquid Gas can keep it going. If they can keep a real strong pace and they have riders capable of doing that uh, for another five, six kilometres, well, then you get very close to the finish. And uh, difficult then for anybody to take a uh, take an advantage uh, from the big favourites. And of course, the last number of kilometres as well, it, uh, it levels off for a year and it's not majorly difficult. So again, there, when you get into that last four, four and a half kilometres is relatively uh, flattens out so again I don't see any big gaps uh, appearing there between the big favourites Andre Amador and Alessandro De Marchi have six minutes and nine seconds looking good at the moment for at least challenging for the stage win today who how far will they work together still some of the sky men sitting in here which is a good place to be sitting closer to the back than it perhaps He'd want to is Rigoberto Uran. Just on the left of your shot there, the blue stripe down the back. See the red roundel on the back of the shorts for uh, sponsor IG Markets. But uh, Rigoberto Uran still there. Christian van der Velder in there for Garmin Barracuda. We know that Ryder Heijdal is there. Van der Velder there to shepherd him along. Somebody asking Joe McTagg, saying, what happened to Rohano? He's back in the peloton. Simple. Didn't go as fast as the peloton going down the hill. And Jan Barter has given it a huge amount of effort today. Needs to uh, practice that descending, though, Sean. What do you do when you ride as strong as Barter and you simply can't go down very quickly? Well, uh it's always difficult uh, when you get to this level and you know you have been uh, biking for a number of years if you cannot get down uh, at this point in your career well then it's always difficult uh, to improve of course when you start off as a underage in junior if you're not good you haven't been maybe coming from a country where there's mm. a lot of descents long descents with very technical stuff you can understand but you can learn the tricks of the trade and your descending can improve a lot so uh, when you get to this point in you know you're in a profession for a number of years as bad days it's just that you're nervous and uh, when you're nervous you're just always on the brakes and you, when, when you're nervous as well you just relax you're very very tense on the bike and that is really difficult to send in that uh, style. Yes, it was painful to watch, wasn't it, really? As a Serpa. Uh, Visconti. Visconti was another of the riders, I was saying, Sean, is in this group. Serpa's done some work for Rohano here, keeping him up towards the front of the group. It can't be going too fast still yet because uh, not only is Giovanni Visconti climbing well with them at the moment, a little bit at the back, but not too bad, but we saw Valerio in Agnoli disappear off the front of pace setting go back into the peloton and now he's back on the front again or within that front group again so he's clearly had to come back up and put more effort in to keep it going yes i think uh, it's definitely not going at full bore in the main peloton and uh, you can see the amount of riders are still in there but again there's still a sufficient amount of time because for our leaders as we go here 8.5 kilometers the gap is coming down 542 uh, there is sufficient amount of time for you know the big favours to start uh, open the pace and giving a test to each other to see how uh, everybody is feeling and on the steeper sections as we can see the bunt just goes to the 10 kilometres to go so um, it's not over yet twice before Torino has been a stage host or finish and the first time was in 1960 when Aldo Kazinyanka won the stage. And the last time in 1997 when Ivan Gotti, winner of the Giro d'Italia, of course, climbed his way to victory here at Cervinia. He was riding for Seiko at the time. Some riders beginning to suffer on the length. Well, there's Visconti. He was in that front group. And here we are, Sean, now. Sixes and sevens coming out the back. And now, as the uh, pace has been set, they've shed quite a few, actually. Caruso on the front rider. Heijdal there, looking over at Frank Schleck. Damiano uh, Kunigo in the pink and the blue of Lamprey. Just uh, trying to hang in there again now. He's been on the attack already. Rodriguez in the old pink, looking comfortable. Scarponi in the pink and blue behind him. 
Kreuziger for Astana with Tiralongo just ahead of him. Ah, well, Caruso setting a fabulous pace here on the front now, and this has actually shed far more than I expected at this point. Yes, and I think we're in a section where it has kicked up a bit, and the percentage is you know, certainly getting stronger, and uh, a lot of riders getting into difficulty. And we can see there with uh, uh, Liquid Gas, uh, Schmidt is just waiting there, and when he takes it up, we all yep. know the damage that he can do. And uh, if he's on a good day, he can just set the pace for... Uh, a long, long time, quite a number of kilometres, and uh, uh, if he can do that today, well, then we will see more starting to lose contact. Tira Longo sits ahead of Kroisiget. He's climbing so well at the moment, so strongly. Uh, Paolo Tira Longo, but he's on duty for team leader Roman Kroisiget now. And slipping inexorably off the back. De Klerk, Bart De Klerk. Who else is beginning to suffer here? It's uh, Alaboto Losada of Katusha. But really, at this stage of the game, Sean, unless you've got super climbing domestiques around you, it's a case of uh, just hanging in there. You just ride your own pace. Yes, uh, well, there's, there's some of the riders here which we see slipping off there. Like a bit scrunty, uh, I think, you know, they're uh, maybe, uh, as we talked about, taking a bit of time today, lose a bit of time because Visconti is very much up at the general classification. Uh, the question is, is he really suffering or does he want to take maybe five or six minutes and have a go in another day and try and get a stage victory? But uh, a lot of riders getting a difficulty, twos and threes all over the road at the moment. two leading men, Paolo Di Negri in the white there of Androni and the dark blue clad rider Andre Amador of Movistar. They are both uh, very facially expressive riders, aren't they? And four minutes and 42 seconds short, it's looking increasingly as though the pendulum is perhaps beginning to swing the way of the peloton with seven and a half, seven, well, just under seven and a half kilometers to go. Still, they can still do it but the gap is coming down. Yes, it is. It's very much in the balance, as we can see there. To get to the front. Yes, uh, to get in the front, but uh, uh, 7.2 kilometres. When you look at uh, our uh, manual at four kilometres, it does ease off a lot, and uh, I think that is going to be the advantage for the two out in front. Uh, again, if they continue on making this pace, that four minutes 50, it should be enough for our two leaders if they can keep on working as they have been and... That four kilometres will be the, you know, the, uh, I think, swing the balance to our two leaders on the road. De Marchi, number 26 there, the blue arm warmers, and Andre Amador. De Marchi really uh, suffering, although he does pull a lot of faces, De Marchi. He's a very expressive rider, and Jan Barter is almost up with them. Oh, hats off to the man. Really, I tell you what, if these three get to the top and they get to the last kilometre together, there's going to be some old scrap. Well, he uh, he deserves to get a stage victory, but the way he's been riding today, going out on the first climb of the day and you know doing all that climb of uh, Col de Joux on his own and then the, the descent very poorly, but still was out there. And you know, what a battle he's had there. He's been hanging there at 15, 20 seconds for you know five or six kilometres and he just clawed his way back. I think you have to give him your... Know, 10 points for just you know, digging in there and keeping walking at it and now he's got back into two leaders but how much has he got left in the tank? Well that's the big question, how much has he got left in the tank but he deserves it just for the effort he's put in. Schmidt gets to the front, one, two, three, four, Caruso sits behind uh, Basso now, how many other riders will we see? Slipping gracefully, gently off the back, 10-0 uh, Kangert is the last man in line here, and Rigoberto Oran looks a little under pressure here, Sean. Well, he's sitting a long way off. Um, he's a long way off. But again, if there's a team making a pace, uh, you can do that. But uh, 
the moment uh, that it slows down a, a little bit and uh, you you know that from experience uh, when the liquid gas guys they start running out of manpower on the front that's where you have to be careful a little bit closer uh, to the front of the bunch because there is surely somebody going to attack if it does slow down a bit but for the moment there's no problem with that because the pace being set by Schmidt we can see the faces of all the riders uh, Everybody suffering a little bit here at the moment, and some suffering big time. Yep, Heijdal suffering. Kunigo looks like he's suffering. Sergio Heño is still in this group. He is suffering. One wonders whether Rigoberto around is just waiting to spring something. He's been riding pretty strongly. Borisigan, number 31, looks comfortable. Rodriguez in the pink jersey looks comfortable at the moment. Jan Barta comes through and does some work at the front. Well, that's a man that... Uh, Alessandro De Marchi won't throw uh, the evil eye at. He'll look at Jan Barta and say, well, good on you for getting there. My word, he suffered today. <laughs> three, three visually expressive riders there. Fantastic. You could take these three riders, couldn't you, and transport them 80 years back, put them on big heavy bikes, put them in old clothing and mud splattered faces and just epitomised biking four minutes and four seconds with six uh, kilometres to go Monteguti is taken back De Negri here for Farnese Vini his uh, day is run and he'll just the peloton will pass him and he'll just go out the back door sadly and the group is again it's down a little bit more Sean there's about 20 22 riders here no more Yes, and we can see also the AGTO or the Monteguti mm -hmm. uh, just being swallowed up uh, by the main bunch there. And we can see it's just getting small, this leading group now, riders uh, losing the contact. And um, Schmidt, of course, you know, he, if he's on a good day, he will do a lot more and uh, he will cause a lot of riders' problems here to hang in in this main group of big favourites. Paolo Di Negri, end of the day for him. The man just away from the pace line, closer to us, taking a drink, is Thomas de Ghent, winner of a stage in Paris-Nice this year, solo ride. Probably some very lumpy terrain indeed. Going down into Nice, in fact. And there he is, sitting at the front. Well, he's been going very well so far, Sean. I... Possibly, maybe if the pace is a little bit harder, he might suffer, but uh, he knows how to take the pressure, that's for sure. He's not phased by it, is he? No, well, he's, uh, he's a rider that's improved the last uh, two or three years, and his climbing ability has improved a lot. And uh, again, today, he's you know, up there, and he has been the last number of days uh, we've seen him, and uh, I think he finished uh, just outside the place of the podium when Pozo Vivo won. Uh, yes, he did, yes. He was just beaten by Rodriguez in the sprint. Uh, Chastity was just ahead of the group there and uh, impressive on that day, but more impressive today because these long climbs I was expecting maybe to be a little bit of difficulty, but looks quite comfortable there on the front end of the group of big favourites. Come on, Jan, hang in there. Get back to them again. Just drifting a little bit off the back as Amador got to the uh, got on the pace making net. Ajidal sitting in the middle, the tall rider in the blue and black and white looks like he's suffering a little bit. Podzavivo is right behind him, Scarponi uh, blowing a little. Kroesiger once again looking very comfortable. We've seen it before that he can look very comfortable, turn a big gear and then suddenly he'll go pop. Five point two kilometers left to go. It won't be long. They'll be aware of it if they've studied this short. It won't be long before they know it's beginning to flatten out a little bit. Yes, they certainly will know, and uh, if they haven't uh, looked at their route book this morning, they will be, you know, uh, by the team directors that they, uh, you know, the gap is coming down 3.30 at the moment as we come to the five kilometre mark. They'll be well aware of that, but they will be also told, you know, the last four kilometres, they'll be probably saying, oh, it's flat this last four kilometres, you can't hold on, keep going, guys, and that will be the role of each director because they all want to, to get to the finish here and uh, see who is the best man in the uh, in the final kilometre or in the final number of kilometres or if it comes down to a sprint uh, you know they've been out there all day and uh, they all I suppose deserve to get a stage victory after such a big a big ride and a big battle all day to hold on out in front Andre Amador looking for all the world like a 
Like some sort of uh, gym going fit fit bouncer. It's no good exhorting Jan Barter to do any more work. He can't. Amador, you are a cheeky one. Clearly. The marquee looking like a sort of tall, slightly, uh, it looks more like an athlete, a track and field athlete. Tall, lithe of limb. Jan Barter in the middle there looking like he's just come out of a punch up. I wouldn't know who my money's on on those. I think Barter's probably got nothing left in the tank, Sean. And uh, Amador, to me, looks like the dangerous one. But Demarkey will be spitting blood if he gets it in the sprint, that's for sure. These are our three leading men. They went out in a breakaway. It took 70 kilometres for the breakaway to establish itself because they were going hell for leather first thing this morning. 50 kilometres an hour plus in the first uh, 70k. Unbelievable, really. Macho Montaguti of AG2 Le Mondial. De Marchi, who's still in this group here. Paolo Di Negri, we've just seen him swallowed up by the peloton. Olivier Kaysen. Uh, more miles in the bank for the Fuga Pinarello prize, the breakaway uh, prize, breakaway distance prize. Andre Amador in this group that we're watching from the helicopter shots. Nicolas Mace was back in the main peloton and now been dropped, I'm sure. Nelson Oliveria was uh, reeled back in along with Olivier Kaysen. And Jan Barter. Jan Barter has fought all day here and De Marchi has decided, well, I'm going to... Oh, no, sorry, it's Rohan. I thought it was De Marchi over the top for a minute. Oh, is it Rohanu? Well... We did mention Sean, he might have another go. Not, not getting very far at the moment. Difficult man to attack, Sylvester Schmidt. Four point seven kilometers for our leading uh, three men. As the peloton and the main favourites whittle down to what about uh, twenty-five riders enter the mists at the top of uh, Trevinia here. Jose, not to be for you today, I'm afraid. Get yourself back in the peloton. Rabobank's orange-clad uh, Tom Schlachter still in this group as well. He's climbing well, isn't he, Sean? Tom Schlachter. Yes, uh, he's uh, been impressive in the last uh, week, certainly, and uh, looking uh, to get getting in better shape as we see Sandy Cassar who is uh, in the general classification he's very much up there in tall position uh, fighting here at the moment to cling on on the rear end of the peloton slowly slowly doesn't matter how much you fight Tanel Kanga, the Estonian, is going to succumb to the relentless pressure now being put on by Sylvester Schmidt, who's up to gear. Kreuziger looks over his shoulder to see who uh, is able to follow as he hangs in behind Paolo Terolongo. No real problems yet for the main favourites. Should be back with them, really, because that's where the action's happening. Di Marchi looks over his shoulder at the, uh, at the traitorous Amador. And that's it for Sylvester Schmidt. It's down to the big favourites. And Ivan Basso has to take the lead, Sean. He hasn't really got any choice, has he? Because his team has worked for him all the way. And now he's got to pile on the pressure. He has to. It's down to him now. He can take a kilometre or so to see who he can shed out the back here. Yes, and uh, he's coming to the section where it, uh, it's going to ease off the final four kilometres. And I think he'll be aware of that. He has to uh, continue on making the pace when he's last... Uh, man peels off the front because if he just slows down well then there's going to be a lot of riders will go on the attack here and to get through this section where it's a little bit steep but if you can get to that four four and a half kilometers where it eases off then it's more difficult for anybody to attack and i think that's the, the tactic of basso Ooh. as we see posa viva they're almost becoming a cropper with a spectator absolutely yeah the tifosi would you think there's a few excited tifosi about Uh, yes, Domenico Pozzaviva almost being uh, dragged off the bike there. 
I'm surprised that Dario Cataldo is still in there. Here goes uh, Di Marchi. He's not going to wake. Here comes Amador after him. Jan Barta straight onto the wheel of Amador. Go on, Jan. You've got to, uh, you've got to hand it to him. It's a little bit flatter, and that will play into his hands. He's a very strong time trialist, uh, uh, Jan Barter, if he's got anything in the legs. Well, I think uh, they really have to push on here because we have uh, 3.5 kilometers, yep. and the gap is coming down majorly at the moment. Like, it's dropped Ooh. off a lot there, and it's where's going the... to be real tight. Where's team leader? Where's team leader? Says Paolo Terralonga. Where is Roman? Just sitting, sitting back there. There's a bit of playing going on here. Paolo Terralongo is... Uh, jerking the chain of some of the major favourites here. One favourite <laughs> losing ground. Uh, two. Kuna, Kunago and uh, Rohano. This is not uh, Domenico Pozzivivo. I think it's uh, Batalin, isn't it? Going off. Oh, Brambilla, I think. And Brambilla makes uh, the move. I think this is uh, Nieve, or could be Izagiri. But Basso had to take up the, uh, it's Nieve, yes, taking up the challenge. And interestingly, uh, there's a lot of people think that Basso could be put under pressure here, Sean. Heijdal uh, just riding off the front of that little group up to Paolo Tirolongo and seems to be continuing the pace. He's not staying with uh, Nieve here, but look. He's, uh, he's definitely putting people under pressure here. That's great riding. Straight up the road goes Ryder Heijadal, and this sort of terrain suits him very well. Everybody will be very worried about this. Moreno now taking over pace setting at the front of the peloton. They must bring Ryder Heijadal back. Yes, and um, a little bit of uh, tactics there. We could see uh, riders looking at each other, and Heijadal decides to... Uh, uh, to have a go here, but again, we can see with uh, Katusha, they have still men there to look after uh, race leader Joachim Rodriguez, and they are uh, setting the pace, Moreno on the front at the moment, and you know he is a real good climber, he'll just set a strong pace here, and not, not allow Ryder Heijdal to take any major advantage. Hajdal's really going to motor now if he possibly can. He's got Mikel Nieve with him. Nieve will have to settle for bringing himself up in the general classification if he's got this man with him. And Hajdal looks to be putting a wheel length between himself and Nieve. 17 seconds only separate Hajdal, who's already worn the pink jersey in this Giro d'Italia, and uh, these men behind him, uh, Joaquim Rodriguez. Nieve can't stack, uh, can't hack the pace there, Sean. 3.35, he's back. And Hajdal is looking very good indeed. really on the limit though because uh, you don't often see he's reaching for the the hoods with one arm and still gripping the top of the bars with the other most uncomfortable position to to climb in and he's just absolutely on, on the limit didn't feel as though he could go any uh, deeper at that point Tiralongo climbing so well and looking across to see where Heizadal is he's not happy but he knows he has to wait for Roman Kreisinger has to look after him but Tiralongo, second in line here behind Moreno, not doing any of the, the pace setting work at the moment. Joaquim Rodriguez, the pink jersey, is off off the right of Heijdal. Then Pozzavivo goes. Now Scarponi reacting quickly as Tiralongo, but not too fast. He doesn't want to outstrip his uh, team leader. Rodriguez is going to ride up past Nieve and straight to Ryder Heijdal. That's uh, showing the big stick to the Canadian, saying, I think I can match it. Yes, and. Uh showing the big stick to the other big favourites uh, uh, Klusinger um, we can see uh, you know, uh, not responding there Pozzovivo trying to go uh, Scaffoni also looking but happy to just stay in the wheel of Pozzovivo for the moment and uh, I think they're all suffering a bit here nobody reacting when uh, Joachim Rodriguez immediately, nobody able to just jump onto the wheel and Rodriguez put in a good, uh, a good effort here, a good acceleration big gap Big gap for Ryder Heijdal, and now Scarponi, as always, turning over a big gear. Thanks. Nope, it's time for this. There are people who can be put under pressure here. Kreuziger, I think he feels, possibly, is not quite as good, on good as form as uh, perhaps he's, he's showing normally. He's got that sort of face that doesn't express an awful lot. Ryder Heijdal, fantastic effort. I mean, it's a huge effort. He's weaving all over the road, trying to get his every watt out of his body.
Rodriguez is brought back by Scarponi. Basso on the wheel. Magnificent climbing by the two Skymen. We did... Uh, did to point out that perhaps Rigoberto Ran was just waiting to spring something and he's ridden up as all the others have been shed by the pace he's ridden up into that uh, elite group as has young Sergio Henio this is a magnificent effort for Heisdahl and these three are going to get caught if they're not careful Heisdahl surely will attack onto the back of those men Sean or will he drive will he keep driving at the front of it well I think he will uh, keep driving uh, if he can uh, which it looks like he's going to get back to them because I think uh, the three leaders are totally uh, at the end of their powers. We see Pozaviva putting in an attack here. Uh, Heusdal is, you know, really giving it everything here and uh, it looks like that he could uh, very well swallow up our three leaders on the road. Koisiga has gone. Koisiga is not there, Sean. Roman Koisiga has been dropped from that group and as we just were talking about it, I had a suspicion that Tiralongo was so much stronger than Koisinger. But Koisinger wasn't on his wheel. He kept looking back to see where he was as Demarki goes with 1,200 metres. And Jan Barter is towing. <laughs> and oh, look at Jan Barter. Under the kilometre to go banner. I'm sorry. I like Demarki as a rider. Amador has entertained us uh, on the descent today. But Jan Barter for me should have this one really just uh, for work rate and effort he's worked so so hard to get back up to them now sits in the wheel of Andre Amador and I cannot see him winning the sprint uh, Sean he's a magnificent time trialist and Ryder Heijadal is not too far behind them maybe he'll catch them maybe he won't I don't think he's going to get there now no I think with the uh, run in here uh, it's uh, leveled off a lot it's not uh, the gradient is not steep at all so uh, I think our three leaders uh, will hold on. Looks like, is that Kroisiger has got back here? Or is that Tiralongo? Tiralongo. I think it's Tiralongo. Amador and Demarki and Jan Bartra are going to slug it out at the finish. Oh, you could pay for Amador's coming around with what? 200 metres to go. Demarki sitting in there. He's got to spring a surprise on Amador if he possibly can. Jan Barter still has it. One more effort from Jan Barter. Go on, Jan! 150 metres to go. He's got to the front, but I don't think he's going to stay there. He's going to give it everything. Amador's going to come around the outside. It's over for Jan Barter. Amador takes the win. Barter takes second. And Demarki takes third. Andre Amador takes it. I wouldn't be surprised if they have to carry Jan Barter off the mountain now. Here comes Ryder Heijadal. Uh, the question is, what will be the gap between them? Heijadal driving for the line. Brilliant ride. 20 seconds behind the uh, leaders. He only had 17 seconds to make up. So look, wait, that clock counts to uh, 37. And... Uh, Driving for the line, Tiralongo. The pink jersey is going to change hands. Tiralongo must surely become the leader here of uh, the uh, Astana effort. Pink jersey's gone. Heijadal gets it. 46 seconds they come over. And uh, what a day, Sean, in the end. We thought it was all going to be controlled and maybe a damp script. Brilliant ride by Sergio Henio again. Terrific ride and by Rigoberto Oran, but uh, the pink jersey goes from the shoulders of Joaquim Rodriguez and Ryder Heizadar, what a ride, fabulous ride. Kassar in here as well. Great ride by Sandy. All in bits here. Schlachter comes home. Kunigo is in this group. Sergei Lagutin, the Uzbek uh, national champion. Second in line here. Schlachter's going to come out from around the outside and see if he can get uh, the next place in, can he? Yes, he can. Wow, what a finish, Sean. That was super exciting. Yes. Far more exciting than I expect. What a final. And uh, our three leaders, uh, our three breakaway men, what a fight they put up for the stage victory. Um, and I think Heisdahl, you know, he put in a magnificent effort in the final kilometres there to just hold off the group and uh, a lot of the big favourites thrown in the attacks trying to take him back and a magnificent job and uh, moves back into race leadership. Absolutely, really, really magnificent job.
Schmidt and uh, Caruso coming through. What about uh, Roman Kreisinger, though, Sean? He's, he, he went. I had a suspicion, and I voiced it, that he didn't look as... as uh, he wasn't as good as perhaps he looked. He has that sort of stony face, and it's, it proved to be the case. He got blown out of that group, and it was Tiro Longo who was the best rider for Astana. Yes, uh, in a little bit of difficulty when uh, it was really you know, going very, very fast and the, uh, a big attack, and uh, just found it difficult to follow the pace, and uh, that tells us maybe not as comfortable. And again, what is the reason? Is the weather conditions? Uh, we will have to wait and see for another day. But he saved, I think, he saved his uh, his position. He saved his place. Really, today did not blow big time. Last shot from Vacon Soleil driving for the line. Stefano Pirazzi comes over the line for Colnago. They all look absolutely beat. They're giving it. Is that last back? <laughs> Magnificent. Or de grief. Is it de grief? I thought it was back for a minute. Anyway, magnificent. They're all magnificent. What a fight for the three in the end. I've got to say, it was a titanic scrap. You had to sort of favour Amador, really. He just looked a little bit more comfortable there, Sean. Demarkey was not going to give it to him on a plate, for sure. Here we are. Look look at Jan Barter. I thought he was dead at 500 metres. And he went, but he sort of... He, he didn't have an awful lot of choice, did he? And uh, Demarkey was the one who failed in the end. Uh, but Amador still having enough strength, brute strength, to come past Jan Barter. I don't think Jan Barter had much of a choice. He just had gave it everything that he possibly could. Well, I think uh, he gave it more than everything. I think uh, on the final line, we could see him there trying to make it back to the Marquis and Amador. And uh, it took him five or six kilometres. He was only... 150, 200 metres, but still 20 seconds, 25 seconds on the climb and scrubbed his way back to them. And then we see in the end when DeMarkey went, it was uh, Bato who closed it down. He looked to be already cooked there, but still had to go on the sprint and you know put up a big battle. But uh, it was Amador who had just that little bit more of energy left. Yep. Well, I hope we show that shot of uh, Jan Barter again as he uh, came over the line. Bar Barter gets second anyway. DeMarkey, then Heijedal. 26 seconds back to Paolo Terralonga, Rigoberto Oran, Joaquim Rodriguez and Thomas de Ghent still hanging in there as well. Well, who'd have believed it? What a day. Scarponi there, Gadre there, Schleck in there as well. In all the excitement, I didn't even see him come over. Podzivivo, Ivan Basso, great raid, ride by young Sergio Henio. Again, Benyat in Chausti looked to be under the cosh today. But uh, two in the top 15 for Movistar. Not the most pleasant of days in the saddle, Sean, in terms of weather, and it sorted out a few men from boys today. Well, I think uh, it did, uh, as we can see, the standings overall. Heijdal moves into uh, leadership. Joachim Rodriguez at nine, and uh, Paulo Tiolongo is still up there very much in the general classification at 41. Uh, Sandy Casar hanging in well. It looked like that he was in difficulty a, a couple of kilometres from the finish, but still very much up in the general classification. Absolutely. Magnificent scrap for the win today. And uh, Andre Amador, the Costa Rican rider, said in three breakaways, given lots of effort to try and get there, takes the win. But rider Heijdal really attacked and took over the pink jersey once again. Tiralongo, best of Astana. Kreisinger out the back door.